the Board of Library Trustees are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows the Board of Library Trustees to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Um, members of the public who wish to view the live stream of this meeting may do so by going to Northboro Remote Meetings on YouTube via the link listed on the agenda. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mitch Cohen. Mitch Cohen, I'm here. Jim Hogan. Here. Hamilton is not. Nita Karanjkar. Nita here. Jocelyn McHelany. Oh, you're mute. Jocelyn McKelleny present. Thank you. Charles Reccia. Charles Reccia here. Joan Scott. You're mute. Sorry. Joan Scott present. Okay. Richard Tucker. Richard Tucker present. Thank you. And Michelle Rehill is present. All right. Since a majority of the board is present and it is after the hour of 5.30 p.m. I will call the meeting to order at 5.39 p.m. And um, the process for tonight is to yep, interview the three candidates. Um, the first candidate is Sandra Murphy. She, will, she is in the waiting room currently. Um, Bernie Lynch is going to, um, so, what, what's the thing I'm trying to say? I was gonna say navigate for us, but that's not so, correct. Facilitate. Facilitate, thank you, that's the word I wanted. All right, so Bernie's gonna facilitate uh, the questions. Um, if at any point you, any of the trustees want to ask a specific question, please just leave wave your hand so that we know that you want to and you can unmute yourself and ask your question when I say, oh yeah, Charles or whoever. Um, so we have, like I said, it's a list of questions, very broad. It will be more conversational than uh, just a, a grilling of the candidates. And um, are there any questions about the process for tonight? If nobody has any questions, um, then if we are already, well, is it 540, it's a little bit early, but if, if everyone is ready, we can bring in the first candidate, Sandra Murphy. If I, if I, Ooh, yeah. Yes, okay, Bernie, I sorry. Say, Go ahead, Bernie. Could, we can get started now and that might give us, people who want to take a break between candidates. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that uh, we would, would uh, probably just do the interviews and then at the end of the evening decide, I don't think we decided what we were going to do is the next step in terms of uh, whether you want to make a decision tonight or have another meeting that we need to set up to uh, actually take the, uh, the vote of the uh, board. So we can discuss that at the end as opposed to discussing the candidates as a screening committee does. A screening committee typically talks about candidates after their interview and then moves on we would save all of that till the end of the process. Okay, that makes sense to me. And then at the end, I think we can have the conversation and see the feeling of the board and, and just see how, if we wanna move forward and say, yes, we feel very strongly about this one candidate, let's do it. Or if people really feel the need to mull it over and think about it, uh, mm -hmm. we can pick a date to meet sometime next week yep. and, um, and make the decision, have a discussion, a deeper discussion and make a decision then. Right. So that will be by the will of the board. So. So we're ready. Are we I'm ready? sorry, Michelle, I didn't mean to talk over you. If we're ready, I'm gonna let um, Sandra back in. Okay, I think we're ready. Bring her in, please. There she comes. And there she is. Hi, Sandra. Oh. You're muted. 
Right, I have to unmute. There we that's, go. Someone, someone told me that's going to be the phrase of 2020. Unmute. Either you're muted or I can't hear, we can't hear you. So well, welcome, uh, welcome to the meeting, Sandra. And uh, what I'll do, Michelle, if I could, is just uh, perhaps uh, turn it over to you and then uh, you can welcome Sandra and then move through, uh, have each member introduce themselves. All right, so Sandra, uh, welcome to the Board of Trustees. Uh, we are missing one trustee tonight, um, and he was unexpectedly called into another work meeting, um, or into a work meeting that he could not miss. Um, so that being said, um, Bernie is going to be uh, facilitating this meeting for us, but I will have the board uh, introduce themselves to you, and I'll follow my little list. Um, Mitch? Hi, Mitch Cullen. Uh, nice to see you again, uh, Vice Chair of the Library Board of Trustees. You might re recognize him. All right. Jim Hogan. Oh, you mute. There we go. <laughs> Jim Hogan, I'm the Secretary of the Board. Greg, great to meet you. Nice to meet you. And Hamilton's absent. Nita. Hi. Oh. I'm Nita. Nice to meet you and good luck. Jocelyn. Hi, Jocelyn McKelleny. Nice to meet you. And, oh, I don't know if you can hear that. It's thundering here. Sorry, Charles. Yeah, hello. I'm Charles Reckia, board member. All right. Joan. Hi, I'm Joan Scott. Welcome, Sandra. And Richard, Richard Tucker. Hi, I'm Richard Tucker. Glad to meet you, Sandra. Here. Hey. All right. I think, that's, I think that's it. I think we're good. Right. Well, uh, Sandra, the, the, the process we're going to use tonight is we got roughly an hour. Uh, we have about uh, seven or eight, depending on how we do, topics that we'll want to uh, speak to you about. And uh, I'll be, uh, as Michelle indicated, I will be facilitating the, the discussion. So, um, you know, we just want to have this more of a conversation. And uh, we'll start with, tell us about yourself. Uh, you've met all of us now, and uh, some of us have met you before, but tell us uh, about uh, yourself and uh, how you find yourself interested in the Northboro Library Director position. Sure. So um, let's see. I have been a librarian for almost 10 years now. Um, I started off as a children's librarian. I worked on uh, the vineyard, Martha's Vineyard, um, at the Oak Bluffs Library. So I started off there uh, first part time um, right after I graduated from Simmons and then was hired in October of 2010 to be the children's librarian. I had a great time doing that. Uh, and about a year after that, the director um, and Evening. So I was interim director, but also we didn't have a reference librarian. So I was also the reference librarian. And we also didn't have a children's librarian. So I was kind of doing a little bit of everything, but in a small public library, that's what you do. Um, so then let's see, I became the director um, about like a year and a half after that, or a year, and was the director for in total probably like three years. Um, and we did fantastic things as a very small team, but a very energetic and innovative team. Um, then I had trouble with housing. Finding affordable housing in the vineyard is pretty impossible. Um, so I ended up moving off island. I uh, took a job at the Worcester Public Library as the Youth Services Coordinator um, and oversaw, let's see, four, five branches and about 30 people. Um, and that was a huge step up for me, but I, it was a great opportunity, great experience to hone my managerial skills. I learned a lot from um, having such a big staff um, and I carry a lot of those uh, lessons with me. Um, then I kind of, uh, I had an opportunity that I didn't really want to turn down. So after that, I um, took a year off to travel in uh, Southeast Asia. I volunteered for a month in a library, a school library in Cambodia, and had a, an amazing experience with the kids um, teaching English, but also advocating for their school library, uh, training other um, librarians in the area. And um, 
just connecting with the community and, and the local people there. So that was pretty awesome, uh, life-changing experience. Um, then after that, I traveled around for the rest of the year, came back um, and was hired as the director at the Lemonster Library. So I was there for two and a half years um, and I just left in August. And that experience was for me illuminating and I learned a ton. Uh, I feel like I've really grown as a director since then, um, as a leader, and um, I'm excited for this next step. So I'm interested in your library because I'm looking for a smaller library where I can be um, closer to the staff, um, closer to the community, really be a part of the community. I live in Berlin, so I'm right next door to you guys. And I think um, your library, uh, I've been asking around and it has a great rep uh, reputation. And after getting the full tour, a very impressive building, I think. And I see a lot of potential in your library and um, would love to join your team. Great. I'm gonna, I just wanna press down a little bit. Uh, you know, I think that uh, as you look at your, your background, um, you know, I think you've got some great sort of um, we, we, we have a good sense of why you made the changes that you made along the way. The Oak Bluff situation which is a small town on the vineyard and I know that it's very expensive to live there and it's, it, that becomes difficult. Uh, the Worcester, you know, the Worcester experience for a year and, uh, and then the opportunity that came up so you grab that and that makes sense. And, you know, we, we're, you know, uh, we're familiar with the, the situation in Lemonster and that was a big step to go from the, uh, uh, the uh, position you had in, in Worcester to running the, the city of Lemonster's uh, library and, uh, you, know, you know, have a, an understanding of, of what tr happened there that you've decided to make a change now. But if you were looking at Northboro, where does Northboro fit into your overall career? Uh, trajectory uh, in your mind? I mean, where, where do you go so after? First, I want to apologize. Um, I feel like my internet is not so great. I keep on getting something popping up. So I do apologize if that um, creates some difficulties in hearing me. So I just want to put that out there. Um, yeah. But North, North Bro, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. You come in and out. You probably got to notice that your internet is unstable. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what to do. I, I hate to do this uh, in, in the interview process, but maybe just for a short period, just let's try turning off your video portion, turn off your camera, if that's okay with everybody. Sure. That's okay. All right. I, I, we'll try to come back so that we can actually see you, which is helpful, but it, it might make the answering of the questions a little bit easier, particularly this question, which is an important one of where does Northboro fit into your overall trajectory? So I'm not someone who has um, these huge grandiose ideas of climbing the library ladder. I'm not interested in um, like personal accolades or, um, being a big wig in the, in the library field. I'm really interested in communities and I'm interested, I mean, the reason why I be, became a librarian was because I wanted to, I wanted a job that um, was helpful to people and where I was helping others. And libraries to me, I mean, I really believe in everything that libraries stand for. Um, so I want to work in a community, it's more about the community to me than the actual um, library or the status of the position. I'm not really interested in, I feel like I've worked in all sorts of different libraries so far mm -hmm. um, and gotten a taste of every little thing. And now I kind of have a clear picture of, I'd like to work in a small, medium-ish library, but uh, where a community is diverse and interested um, in the library and supportive and uh, that wants to engage with the library. Um, and I hear so many great things about your community so that's why I initially applied to this position. So I'm not someone who's um, needs bigger and better things. I want um, a, a stable position that um, where the board is supportive and the staff are supportive and wanna work as a team and wants to like try exciting new things and, and grow together. I guess that's more important to me. Okay. For the, for the committee, 
which has a listing of our topics. I'm going to drop down to the third topic. I'm going to, I want to get into that a little bit in terms of the library mission. Uh, I want to understand why one thing that hasn't become clear, and I want you to sort of explain it to us is why you, why you ever chose to go into the field of libraries. Tell us oh, that, okay. tell us that story. Sure. So that's, um, I guess I always grew up in libraries. Um, we didn't have a ton of money growing up. So I would go to uh, Shrewsbury Public Library and I would go to the Northboro Public Library uh, weekly. And um, I'm someone who I think was destined to be a librarian because um, just an information seeker and someone who constantly read and was always wanting to learn new things. And the library is an ideal place for that kind of person. Um, I worked in my college library at uh, MCLA and that was my first library job. And I helped other students um, check out materials and you know, just did some like grunt work at the desk. Um, but I could really see myself behind the desk, I guess. And um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. So uh, can you repeat the question? I was just wondering what your story was of what, what brought you to want to be a librarian. Sure, so sorry. Um, when I was in college and about to graduate, I had a couple of professors who told me that I should go to grad school. And I thought, nope, I am not interested in more schooling. I'm good. Um, and the seed was kind of planted there. And to be honest, what do you do with an English major um, degree? You can't really, you go into many different fields, but uh, my dad was the one who said, hey, how about being a librarian? It seems like, um, stable job. There's always libraries around. Uh, I think he didn't really understand budgets <laughs> at that point and how they can fluctuate. But um, uh, he was the one that really planted the seed of libraries in my brain. So I applied to Simmons and got in. And it, I remember my first day of class and I was like, these are my people. I'm home. I feel like I'm supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and I just truly believe in what libraries stand for. Um, okay, as far great. As well, that, let's use that as your jumping off point. What's, what's your vision of a successful library? The, the Northboro Library, if, if you were appointed to be the director, what would, how would you determine that the library, the Northboro Library was a success? Hmm. Um, first, I guess success would mean, uh, you could look at the numbers. So the numbers would increase, um, maybe not uh, checkouts because that's been fluctuating for years um, because of eBooks and also just people's habits. But um, you could look at programming numbers. Uh, you could look at a, a library attendance numbers and those would be hopefully increasing or at least staying the same. Um, another aspect would be, um, are you reaching members of the community that maybe haven't come in before? Uh, people who have just moved to town um, people who don't, uh, who are maybe new to the country and don't really know uh, what uh, American libraries uh, can offer. Um, success to me is not just by the numbers. Um, obviously, for me, it's more how do how does the community engage with the staff with um, with the library itself. So are they supportive um, if we are asking for more money, for example? Um, do they uh, engage with the library? Do they support the library? Um, so that to me would be a better sign of success if um, libraries, other libraries in the surrounding towns are, are reaching out to us for um, to collaborate or to engage with if all the departments in Northboro are collab want to collaborate with the library. Uh, this, those kinds of things would be measures of success. And finally, um, is the staff happy? Uh, do the staff love coming to work every day? That is huge. That would be a, a major measure of success for me. Okay. When you look at, and you've been now in three different libraries, a small town uh, you know, on an island, uh, a large city, uh, a medium-sized city. Um, what's your vision of, uh, or what, what's your, what trends do you see in uh, the world of public libraries that most excite you? 
It's hard to say right now because trends in the time of COVID or post COVID, we don't know what they will be. Um, trends that I was loving uh, seeing, um, I guess was just a library that was more outward facing libraries who, um, there's a library in Colorado that I'm absolutely obsessed with and they have a artist in residence which I think is just fantastic. And they have a, um, a little studio for this person and it changes whatever, maybe um, every six months or quarterly or something like that. Um, that to me is really exciting. Um, showcasing community members in that way uh, to me is very progressive. Um, the makerspace trend is an interesting one. Uh, not one that I was 100% in love with. I think the concept is really great, but I love, um, what it actually is doing, which is um, getting people to learn new technologies or um, also basic skills that they might not have. So um, offering sewing machines, for example. Sewing is not something that everyone knows how to do. Maybe of a certain age, people know how to sew, but younger people are looking to get these kind of old world skills um, under their belt where maybe they don't have them. Um, some things that we would maybe consider basic, like I just taught myself how to can using books from the library. So I've been canning in the past uh, three months and that's been really exciting, but um, how can the library uh, support that kind of um, skills-based learning, I think is uh, a very exciting trend. And libraries are um, a proponent for share culture. I mean, share culture is literally what the library does. We share materials, we share books, information, resources. Um, so that is a trend, looking at the library as, um, as part of, as something that can provide you more than just books mm -hmm. um, and skills, I guess, is, is a trend that I love. Okay, great. Um, what type of programming, uh, along those same lines, what types of programming uh, when you, I assume in uh, Leminster and certainly in Oak Bluffs, you played a major role, and, and, and probably to, to, to a degree, sir, you can tell me, in Worcester. What are the types of programming that you would you would see uh, putting in place in in Northboro, or what? And, and give us some examples of some programming you put in place in in other communities. Yes. So programming is, I would say, one of my biggest strengths, and it it's so exciting to me, and I think. There is no limit to what you can do in the library or on the lawn or virtually at this point. Um, in Oak Bluffs, we used to do crazy things, but it's a small community on an island, right? So you can get away with doing kind of wild stuff. But we had a 1950s sock hop and we um, converted the program room into a soda fountain. The whole staff wore uh, 50s costumes and it was an amazing intergenerational program. So people from that were, you know, jiving in the 50s came, uh, young people came, all sorts of people uh, were interested in that sort of like um, imaginative play. Mm -hmm. um, we had a luau with a full pig roast on the lawn once in Oak Bluffs. Um, that was pretty awesome. Um, and then we also would like collaborate with local uh, talent. So there was a very young um, high school graduate and he was a budding photographer kind of making his way in the world and um, ended up moving to New York City and he uh, is doing great things now. But um, we got a grant from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to uh, geek the library, like build a campaign. Uh, this was uh, a bunch of years ago. I don't know if you guys remember it, but we had, um, he came in and set up a whole photography studio and over two days we photographed community members and then made a giant photo display in the community room and had it uh, open for one or two months and people would come in and uh, each, everyone got their picture taken and it said, I geek and then whatever you're into, geek meaning like I'm, I'm super obsessed with or I, I'm really excited by X, Y, Z. So uh, mine was adventure and I had a you know very cool photo of myself and it said, I geek adventure. Um, so reaching out to people in the community collaborating with them uh, based on whatever their talents are. Um, I've also, I'm not above, uh, you know, dressing up for children's programs. I love kids programs. Uh, I was once Elsa at a frozen party 
uh, with the wig and dress and everything, makeup. Um, and we had 300 people come to that frozen party. And it was one of the best memories I have. There's a picture of me as Elsa dressed up with like about 50 little Elsas who also came to the party and it was really hilarious and fun. Um, in Lemonster, I had, uh, I put together a how-to festival. Um, so this is kind of what I was talking about with the um, skills-based programming. Um, so we had, I don't even remember, like 25 people come and it was an all day thing. And uh, there was something to learn at each station. So one person was how to repair a bicycle, how to patch a hole in the wall, um, how to fold a fitted sheet was a very popular one. And then we had some keynote speakers um, that were doing like a ukulele class or you know, other sorts of things. So that was a full day event that um, got a lot of community members excited. Um, I'm also really into mini golf in the library. I think it's an amazing way to let people see parts of the library that they might not visit. For children, it's an amazing way for them to see the library um, that they might not be allowed to go <laughs> other parts of the building or that, you know, they never would think to go up to the second floor because there's nothing up there for them. Um, and then I love homegrown uh, programs that I do myself, like cookbook club. I had 25 people come every month to my Lemonster cookbook club, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, in Worcester, I was um, trying to lead by example for my staff, so I uh, go to them and do a weekly story time for um, kind of like preschool age. Well, they're a little bit younger, but they ranged really. And um, most of these children did not speak English at home. So that was a fun uh, experience and a, a great learning opportunity for me because I got the chance to uh, adapt my story time to fit their needs and, and their level and where they were at. Um, so those are just a few programs that I've done. I mean, that I would say programming is one of my major, major interests. So uh, I would love to bring some super exciting programs to Northboro. Great, thank you. Uh, now, if I could, it, it, going back to more of the traditional uh, sort of vision of libraries, collection of books, materials, what's your philosophy in managing the library's collection? How do you go about building and maintaining the collection over time? Sure. I mean, this is another one of my main interests because I am a librarian, so I love collection management and collection development. Um, to me, it's extremely important that the collection is uh, appealing to people. Um, I want people to walk in the library and not be overwhelmed by the amount of books you have or movies or whatever. Um, I want them to look at the stacks and be able to find what they want easily, um, preferably without asking someone. That would be a sign that we've done it well with signage and everything that you can find your own uh, material. But of course, we're willing to help if you can. Um, I want things to be orderly because librarian <laughs> and I want things to be um, uh, just in its right place, you know, so um, I'm a huge fan of weeding. I love to get in there. I just weeded um, all of <laughs> Uh, Lemonster's nonfiction collection, which was super intense, but that's what I did during quarantine. Um, and I couldn't like do it for another minute longer after I was finished the project, but it was um, something that should be done <laughs> in a more manageable um, speed, not something you want to really do in an emergency. Of course, um, sometimes you have to do an emergency weed, but I'd rather have a schedule for these things. And um, do it in a way that's more organized than have to do it all at once. Um, how, do you, how do you decide what to weed? How do you decide this book stays, this book goes? Well, that is, first of all, you never do it alone um, because that's, it's just your opinion, right? I try to do everything uh, with a neutral mind, um, but I'm also not an expert in everything. Uh, surprisingly. So like I was weeding the nonfictions uh, collection in Lemonster with uh, my coworker, and I would like history is not uh, my forte. So I let her weed history, and and then I would double check her work basically. So you work as a team to make sure that um, you're not weeding things that you might need down the road. 
Um, there's always a joke in libraries, though, that as soon as you read the book, the next day someone's going to ask for it. Hmm. Um, that's literally just what happens every single time. Um, but also, there's an amazing book called The Core Collection, and it's like um, it's a very expensive book, and it comes out I don't know once maybe every other year or something, and it tells you everything that would be ideal to have in your core collection. And this goes for fiction, nonfiction, children's, they have all sorts of them. So it's this massive, massive book, uh, huge tomes. And you kind of go through and you're like, all right, um, here's this book. Is it in the core collection? No, but is it uh, relating to local history or something that um, the community might be interested in? Yes, okay, then I'll keep it. Um, so that's how I approach it. I also like to touch every single book that I read. Um, you can do some things like run lists that tell you, okay, these are the books that haven't been checked out in three years, but I really like to get my hands on each and every book to make sure that the, you know, there's not weird bookmarks in there or writing or that it's in good condition and that sort of thing. Okay, great. Uh, do any uh, board members have a question at this point? Comments? Okay. Well, let's move on to, you mentioned um, uh, you, you're not an expert in everything. So that, let's talk about your management style. Uh, how do you, talk, tell us about your management style. What's, what's it look like? And um, again, uh, any examples you have of, you know, um, of, of your management style? So yeah, I'm not an expert in, in everything and I don't need to be. And um, I trust uh, and love to hire people that know things that I don't so that we can collaborate and work together. Um, I have a very open door policy um, and I expect my staff to come and um, communicate to me what they need or their concerns or projects that they want to do or really just anything. I really need that feedback from my staff so I know um, where to go next, what to do next. Um, so I have a very collaborative style. I'm also someone that's not micromanagey. Um, I, I don't want that in my, for myself, and I don't think anybody else really loves that kind of style of management. Um, so I trust my staff to do their work. And um, if they need help, certainly they can come to me. I would love to help people or talk them through it. Sometimes people just need to an ear or someone to kind of hash things out together. Um, so I'm supportive in that way, uh, but also just let people kind of uh, run with it. If they have a great idea, I want them to try it, even if it might fail. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid to try new things. And um, I think that's a sign of a, a good manager, someone who um, supports the staff in what they want to learn and what they want to do as well. Um, I'm very um, big on staff attending conferences and workshops and um, learning new things about libraries and communicating with other libraries. I think that's extremely important. Um, in Lemonster, I increased the staff, uh, the budget for um, professional development um, with the board because that's how important it is to me. So I would send um, almost 10 people to the MLA conference. I sent people to uh, ALA and the conference, the Urban Libraries Conference in Brooklyn. Even if they left the library the next month, to me, it was successful because they learned something, they got excited about coming to work every day and they wanted to try new things. Um, so that's, yeah, I think that covers everything. I love to collaborate with staff. Um, I love to learn with them and grow with them. And I'm really looking for a team that um, gets uh, excited to go come to work and is inspired. Okay. Would you say that that's your main way of motivating your employees? Is is in that way, or how do you how do you make sure that they remain motivated and uh, engaged with their with their work? Is it the professional development? What what are your method? What are the methods? Sure. So I think it's um, it's really. It has to be led by the staff. So if someone is interested in um, trying a new program, uh, let them try it. Uh, or if they want to change the you know, collection or if they want any project that staff wants to do, I believe in supporting that because then that gives them uh, buy-in. It makes them interested in what they're doing. 
and it engages them with their work. And when people like what they're doing, they want to come to work every day. They want to um, support their manager um, and work collaboratively collaboratively with them. So I, I believe that um, people need to be excited about what they're doing. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, let's go to the, the sort of the flip side of that. Uh, what have you had any time in your career? Um, and obviously, this is a public meeting. So we have to be somewhat limited in what we can talk about here. But have you disciplined employees? Have you had to uh, deal with employees that aren't, um, you know, that, that need to be held accountable in, um, in some way, uh, attendance or, um, bad performance or, um, anything of that sort. I definitely have. Um, it's obviously no one's favorite thing to do. Um, but I think the first way that I approach it is let's say, um, I had a staff member who was coming in late consistently. And to me, that says there's something going on at home or um, that's not allowing them to get here on time. So I talked to the staff person one-on-one uh, -on -one and just said, hey, is everything okay? Um, I noticed you've been coming in consistently like 12 minutes late. Um, I just wanna make sure that you're, you know, you're okay. And if there's anything I can do um, to support you, I just need you to come in on time. And she said, you know, it's been so hard getting my kids um, ready for school in the morning. Um, so that's why that's been happening, but thank you for mentioning it and I will do better. And she was, and she was, she was better from then on. So simple things like that are just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, then I've had some major, major issues. Um, and I've worked extensively with HR on how to correct um, behaviors and to address um, instances which definitely should not be happening. Um, so I feel like I have a very good handle on the progressive discipline procedures. And I think I have a very empathetic way of addressing these things. I'm not um, a disciplinarian. I, I don't love to do it, but I understand um, that it has to be done. And I do, like I said, I, I trust my staff to be adults and to do their jobs correctly. Um, so that's where I start from. I don't start from a place where um, I think you're going to do something wrong or, or you're trying to abuse um, your position or, or whatever. I, I trust people from the outset and if there needs to be some correction to what's going on, then um, I just very calmly and empathetically uh, address it. Um, but that being said, I've had some, some serious issues and it's made me better as a manager and um, I, I can be firm when I need to be, um, but mostly I also understand that people are human and most mistakes or um, things that they shouldn't be doing are sometimes, most of the time, it's really because they have something going on in their own lives. So I understand that as well. Okay. What do you look for when you're, hire, when you're hiring people for these for positions? What's the major factor that you look at when you're hiring people? It's hard to say because I'm someone who is um, very intuitive. And when I interview people, um, I kind of just get a feeling about them or um, I can hear it in their tone of voice. But I am looking for an energy, an excitement, um, some creative thinking, um, a willingness to work as a team. Uh, all of those things are of interest to me, but uh, I would say one of my major skills is hiring people. I'm really good at it. I, <laughs> I will definitely toot my own horn at that. I uh, have hired some amazing people, um, part-time people, full-time people. And um, one of my, my prides uh, or what's something I'm very proud of is that many part-time people that I've hired um, have gone on to become librarians or who are in library school right now. And that would be one of my proudest accomplishments is, you know, someone who, hey, I'm interested in libraries. I wanna get a part-time job is now a librarian. That to me is exciting. So um, I look for um, a spark, I guess. Okay, good. Moving on to, you know, the, we looked at that sort of the internal relationships. Uh, what to, 
how do you build relationships with the community at large? Uh, how do you um, sort of engage and uh, get the community interested in the library or, uh, um, you, know, you know, supportive of the library? So um, the first step is to show up. So if there are boards and commissions in town, go to a meeting, uh, introduce yourself, say hi. I'm from the library, um, how can we collaborate? We're not even asking what I can do, but just being there. And once people get to know you and uh, see what you're doing, then they'll be more interested and more apt to wanna collaborate. Um, going to local events uh, that are happening in town so people get to know you. Um, and uh, outreach is one of my, my big things. So this kind of ties into that, but um, uh, hosting programs for local community members um, or inviting them to have them in the library. Um, I hired a part-time outreach person in Lemonster and she would just go out to uh, senior centers and um, assisted living facilities, the Spanish American Center and just show up and say, hi, I'm from the library. Is there anything that we can do for you? Um, so that to me is very forward thinking, community facing librarianship. So that's how I like to approach it. Okay. Uh, how about getting uh, working with other town departments? Is that, uh, do you have some examples of how you've worked with other de town departments? Mm, my favorite example is, um, so in Oak Bluffs, I uh, convinced the uh, DPW uh, to bring out all of their trucks, dump trucks, uh, backhoes, like literally any uh, heavy moving vehicle. Uh, park them in our parking lot for a morning and we did a touch a truck program which I think is one of the best collaborations between um, departments. Uh, it's fun for everyone. Uh, kids get to climb all over the machines, uh, sit in the bucket truck, all I mean they have a blast um, and it also involves the fire station and the police station. So we had uh, fire trucks and, and police cars. They got to sit in the back of a police car, which hopefully is the only time they have to do that. Um, beep the horn and play with the, uh, the microphone. It's hilarious stuff. So um, that to me is an, a really like holistic example of how all town departments can participate in one event. Um, so that's my most favorite one. But I find it very... Um, I love to communicate uh, and collaborate with other departments. Uh, in Lemonster, I, during quarantine, um, installed a, uh, a hotspot in both the senior center and the veteran center, which share a parking lot. So effectively it allowed the whole parking lot, this very large parking lot, um, to be wired for, for wireless internet. And um, that to me is a small step to collaboration. Um, but everyone was very thankful. So they could go to those, that shared parking lot and also the library parking lot in order to um, use Wi-Fi. Um, but it doesn't have to be a, a huge collaboration like Touch a Truck. It could just be reaching out and saying, hey, do you guys want to have some internet? <laughs> That's all. Right. Now that particular, the sharing the Wi-Fi, who was that intended to benefit? Was that intended to benefit those departments or... Well, the community, but um, right. also it benefited the departments because then these people were sitting in their parking lot and um, oh, okay. they would get a lot of, you know, uh, um, I guess, good press and also um, could read their flyers and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The, um, w in terms of uh, working with other uh, libraries in the region, uh, do you have experience or do you have experience or uh, examples of how you've done that to uh, build sort of the impact of libraries by working with other communities? That to me is so important. Um, and in my role in Lemonster, I felt like I was this um, really big library surrounded by these other smaller libraries. And I thought, why can't I use my resources to help the library community at large? Um, so one thing I did, uh, which is a little unconventional, but we had a, um, we hosted a uh, women's self-defense class. So we invited uh, librarians um, from our surrounding area to come and do a private um, uh, with a local uh, karate teacher 
do a private class on self-defense. And then we also held that for the community at large as well. So um, I love to host speakers um, for other for li for my staff, but then also invite other libraries to it. And in Lemonster, I got the chance to do that a bunch of times. Um, I think it's so important to collaborate with your fellow librarians and to know what other libraries are doing. I mean, we're all in this together. So during uh, quarantine, I was meeting with about six other library directors uh, weekly via Zoom, and we would just kind of um, commiserate sometimes, but also just uh, put our plans together for how we were approaching reopening. Um, and it was extremely helpful to be able to do that. Okay, good. Uh, in um, any questions that anybody has at this point? Mitch? Hi, um, I was curious as to any experience you have with local fundraising. And what I mean by that is going out to the community to look for whether it be sponsors for a particular event or program or to solicit uh, donations for increasing an operating budget or for a library's endowment fund. Sure, I have a lot of ideas about fundraising. I haven't gotten to do all of them um, which I guess is lucky for me. But um, in Oak Bluffs, I had to do uh, a decent amount of fundraising. Um, we would have our annual mini golf fundraiser. And um, I started that and they're still doing it today. So that benefited the library friends and you know programming thereby and also collections. Um, and that got a lot of interest. Um, I also, I've always wanted to do like a, um, this is like homegrown, like small, uh, aspect of fundraising, but I always wanted to around the holidays have like a giving tree and have little ornaments on it. And um, maybe it would be like um, uh, one ornament would say $15 to buy books in the children's room. Uh, you could take off an ornament and then and sponsor that thing or that program. Um, that's an idea I had. Um, I have done a lot of work on um, I created the, I rewrote the policy, the donation policy in Lemonster to make it more, um, I guess, open to uh, other possibilities. So the way it was written before I got there was that it was pretty much donations were used to buy books. Um, I wanted it to be open for other uses like programming, uh, for example. So I uh, worked with my assistant director to rewrite that and kind of reapproach um, what we use and how, how we use our donations. So uh, also as a children's librarian, I was always out in the community. Um, luckily, I knew a lot of community members. It was a small town, um, trying to get summer reading prizes and donations to support programming. Um, so I wouldn't say I have a, a huge amount of experience in it. Um, I'm, I would love to learn more and, and to grow that aspect. Uh, of my knowledge base, but um, I'm very uh, interested and open to uh, to fundraising. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Let's uh, let's. Uh, that's probably a good segue to talk about uh, uh, another aspect of the position that uh, is certainly important. I do want to come back to something on the uh, the outreach section in a, in a moment, but let's talk about your financial management uh, experience. Uh, you know, what's been your role in developing the budget for the library? How does the process work and what, what's, the, what's the approach that you, you use in developing the budget? Sure, so I've um, managed budgets of about $425,000 and then I managed uh, $1.5 million budgets um, and somewhere in between as well. Um, I approach the budget. Uh, I'm not like a greedy <laughs> library director. I have a vision for what, um, what I'll need for the year and where I'd like to bring the library in the next year. So when I make my budget, I approach it in that way. And I also obviously take into regard what's going on in the town or the city. Um, obviously now this year is going to be a bit tricky, but um, like, for example, last year, when, uh, or this year, I guess, when I was making the budget for Lemonster, um, I wasn't trying to, like, get more and more and more. I, I knew that if I was level funded with a little bit more uh, for the professional development, um, that I could do all the things I wanted to do. Um, so I was advocating, actually, just to be level funded. 
uh, which in the time of COVID turned out, <laughs> worked out very well. Um, I had to go in Lemonster in front of um, the city council and uh, the mayor initially and um, kind of plead my case and explain what I was going to use the money for. Um, I'm also someone who is really good at using um, the, the budget in a creative way, especially in regards to staff. So in Lemonster, I created um, several positions, which when I first got there, the staff was, um, it was very difficult for them to do their actual full-time jobs because they were often on the desk covering um, service desk positions. So I created a part-time uh, reference desk person, um, made sure to hire someone uh, who could speak multiple languages. Um, that was um, important for me to because of the community that was coming in. Um, I hired a, I created a part-time outreach person. I created a part-time um, teen room assistant. So what I did, uh, and that was all with staying level funded. Um, actually, that was all done because the former director and the assistant director were making much more than I was and my assistant director. So that was all just like surplus money that I could have given back to the town, but I had a different idea of how to use it. Um, and that allowed staff to focus more on their actual positions and kind of grow and expand their services in that way. Um, so that's how I approach the budget. Great. Great. Do you, uh, what about grant writing? Do you have uh, much uh, experience? I know you mentioned the um, Bill and Melinda Gates grant that you received, but uh, other grants that you've received for uh, written in? Yep, not, not extensive, but a few. Um, so in Oak Bluffs, I also wrote a grant, um, an LSTA grant. Uh, we. Um, it was for, let's see if I can remember. Oh my gosh, it was so long ago. I don't remember, but it was for something very wonderful and innovative. <laughs> and uh, in Lemonster, we recently, I co-wrote a grant with a coworker um, um, to bring a traveling exhibit on the Transcontinental Railroad to the library. And we also um, got the funds uh, in the grant to do like four programs during that same month. So um, I don't have extensive grant writing knowledge, but I feel like I'm very good at it because I can think um, globally to um, how to, I guess, like um, how to uh, collaborate with other local community members to um, to make the grant the most successful it can be. Okay, great. Um, what about entrepreneurial uh, it's kind of along the lines, I think, of Mitch's question regarding fundraising, um, but, uh, you know, sort of self-supporting initiatives that the library has done, or the use of technology to uh, expand the, um, the presence of the library uh, and its mission within the community. Oh, so um, do you mean social media? Well, sure. Okay. So um, I created both Instagram and Facebook accounts for actually all of the library, no, uh, well, most of the libraries that I have worked in. Um, so social media to me is a very useful tool um, and it changes constantly. So uh, different social medias are <laughs> reaching different people. TikTok is for younger people. Uh, we just created that um, a couple months ago in Lemonster and had gone viral in the first uh, like couple weeks that we had it. So um, I'd love to use social media to promote what the library is doing. And I think that's where a lot of people are right now, especially now during COVID um, where they can't physically be together. Um, I, I also was um, responsible for uh, redesigning, well, not me personally, but I worked with someone who redesigned uh, the Oak Bluffs Library and the Lemonster Library's website. Um, that to me was very important because I wanted a place um, where people could get all the information about the library in one spot. Um, I find the Lemonster Library's website very handsome, but I'm a little partial. So I uh, am very proud of that project and uh, just went live in July. Um, but I also used the, the website to do many different things. So um, you can book a room, but you can also donate on the website. And we kind of expanded and um, 
tried to approach the donations page in a different way. Um, so I think the website is, is a big way to reach people. Um, I always wanted to get an app for a library. I think that would be exciting. Um, very convenient way for people to um, put books on hold and that sort of thing too. I know CW Mars has an app, so maybe taking advantage of that. Great. The, um, in both of, uh, I think in both Oak Bluffs and Lemonster, from what I um, heard, you, um, from your references, you uh, conducted a rebranding. What's that all about? I did. Um, so Oak Bluffs never, actually neither of those libraries had a logo. And to me, um, a logo isn't just a design that you put on bags, but it is also that. Um, to me, it can portray um, uh, like the warmth or whatever mission you're trying to portray. Uh, you guys have a very nice logo, but it, when people see it out in the community, I want them to associate uh, this image with the library. I want it to be synonymous. And after you see it, uh, out in the community on bags or, you know, bumper stickers or whatever, um, you get to feel like it's a familiar place. And for people who um, maybe haven't come in the library, it might make it more approachable. Oh, I've, I've seen that logo around. What is that place? Oh, it's the library. Cool. Maybe I should go check it out. Um, branding to me is very important. I am um, very creative with signage and um, that kind of plays into, I want people to know where things are in the building and how to find them. Um, I don't know, this is very like library nerdy stuff, but there's um, an Indian philosopher uh, called, uh, or library scientist actually, um, Ranganathan, and he created the five laws of library science. So getting really deep into library science right now, but uh, one of them is, um, one of the laws is to make things easy for the user. And I truly believe that it should be very seamless and easy for people to use the library. Um, I want people to find it to be um, very exciting and um, I don't know, like a very positive experience when people leave. So um, kind of got off track there, but I get really excited about library science. Um, <laughs> uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think so. It gives us a sense of what the branding exercise was all about. Let's talk about the facility though, for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, you saw the, the library. What, what experience do you have with, uh, right now, uh, the town of North Road does not have a facility manager. They're hoping to have one in place at some point in the near future. That is a goal that the town has to have one person in charge of all the facilities. Um, you'd be in charge of the facility, um, uh, you know, the library facility. Um, so if something goes wrong, you'd be the one who has to, you know, get the person in to fix it or you'd have to climb up on the roof yourself and fix the roof uh, or something of that sort. Uh, I'm that not really... afraid of heights, so I'm very- All right, good. good. I, I, what's, what's been your experience with facility management? What do you think of the North Pearl Library? I, you know, I thought your library was so lovely. I really got a kick out of it. I think the building is fantastic. Uh, the old section, the card catalog was still there and there were still cards in it, which really got me jazzed. Um, to me, it's bright, it's warm. The children's room is fantastic. Uh, it's very adorable. So I think your library is great. I really was pleasantly surprised by it um, when, I, when I went the other day. Um, in Oak Bluffs, I was in charge of the building only in that I had to communicate with the um, DPW uh, department head um, mm -hmm. as to our needs. And it was a, it was a challenge. Um, he was, <laughs> had a lot of things on his plate and so, you know, dealing with um, another flood because of the HVAC system uh, was not really on his priority list, but we had some major uh, problems in Oak Bluffs and the HVAC was one of them. Um, and there were leaks just all the time in the summer. Um, eventually we ended up putting in mini splits. Um, so I think facilities management when you're a director is really about advocating for the building um, it's something that uh, I've, I've been, I've definitely learned a lot, especially in Lemonster, um, because I had a full-time um, craftsman who was fantastic. I just like old world uh, skills that you can't really find these days. And he would fix everything, but I would collaborate with him a lot and, um, and work on uh, what needed to be done. So I kind of gave him a list of, okay, here, let's do this, this, and this, this month. 
and he would kind of just go do it. So that was amazing to have. So when Northboro does get that person, um, he's going to be my best friend yep. because that is the person you need in your corner. <laughs> um, so facilities management is definitely something um, I've gotten a lot better at and um, I'm very organized. And I can kind of see down the line as to what needs to be done. So I, I think I'll be uh, very successful with your building. Okay. Uh, let's try your camera back on for um, the last couple questions here. Let's try it. See, see how that works. All right. Um, one of the relationships that we haven't spoken about is your relationship with the Board of Trustees. What does that look like? Oh. Sure. So um, ideally, it's collaborative. Is it working? Yep. No. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. I love a collaborative. Is that what you asked? Yes. Is your ideal? Yeah, that's good because you kind of cut out. Um, all right, so uh, collaborative relationship with the board. I think the board is um, should be a representation of the community. Um, so people from all all aspects of the community are have a voice at the table and represent different pockets and interest groups. Um, so I, to me, the board sets the tone and the vision for the library. Um, the, the director is someone who uh, who makes the vision a reality. Um, so that's what I'd like from the board, um, clear expectations and goals and um, help me. Uh, I think the board is um, supposed to help me do my job and I'm supposed to help the staff do their job. Uh, so I would love to have a very collaborative, open, um, honest relationship with the board. Okay, great. Does the board have any questions that I haven't asked yet? that you're interested in. Richard? Oh, you're muted. There you go. Yep, you're still muted. There you go. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Uh, you've spoken about uh, some of your successes in um, advocating for your libraries uh, during budgetary discussions. Um, and um, what are you thinking about the next couple of years post COVID, which everyone expects these to be pretty lean years, especially in municipal budgets? Do you have any, uh, have you had any thoughts about that? Sure, I've been thinking a lot about um, post COVID or even like going through the pandemic, um, what the budgets will look like. Ultimately, I wanna work with what I've been given um, but I also um, don't want to settle for uh, not that much. So I would make sure to work very collaboratively with the town administrator. And um, uh, if there's, I um, can't remember the position, and whoever is in the down to make sure that um, the library can grow monetarily in, in a way that's comfortable for the town. Um, someone. Um, so if we can be level funded, I feel like we can work, do more with less, but I, yeah, you may want to shut off advocates you, for, um, the library. You might Sorry. want to shut off, shut off your camera. Sorry, guys. Okay. Sorry about that. It's all right. Um, so yeah, um, someone who um, can work within what I've been given basically. But um, it might be something where we need to do some sort of homegrown programming uh, for a while so that we can um, put our funds towards something else. Um, or we were talking when I was on a tour of your library uh, about that you'll, uh, the book budget was cut. Um, so how can we uh, advocate in the community to raise funds for that and help the friends do that and um, so yes, I've been thinking a lot about what it will look like and hopefully we'll get back on our feet soon, you know? Okay. Other questions that people have? Jim? Go ahead, Jim. Oh, 
I don't know why you're not. <clears throat> yep. You, Jim, you're muted again. Try that. There you go. You're on. You're good. No, nope. oh. it's not. It's not working. This isn't good. Try it again, Jim. You muted. Try try unmuting one more time. Yeah. Can our host see anything that will help, Jim? Who's our host? Is it Deborah? Yes. Deborah? Yes, I have been trying to um, unmute Jim from my end, and it's I can't seem to do it. I have a choice to ask to unmute, or and it just it doesn't happen. Okay. Can I pop in here? It's probably because he has headphones plugged in, and the headphones do not have a microphone attached. That's my guess. Okay. All right. Let's give that a try. Unmute again. Unmute again. Oops. Unmute. Unmute. Okay. Now try it, Jim. Okay. Hey, Jim. Hey. <laughs> hey, was that you? That was you, Jocelyn, who figured that, figured that out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I'm not quite as uh, sanguine um, about the post-pandemic future as some people um, are. So my question is, um, have you given any thought or are you giving any thought to changes that the pandemic might be causing in our society in general that will require um, different approaches uh, from the library to the community in the ways in which we deliver services and deliver information and relate with our patrons. Yes, Good question. I, I think about this constantly and I think it keeps most librarians up at night, but ultimately, Jim, um, libraries evolve constantly and this might be another shift in our evolution. So it might mean uh, that libraries look different in one, two, five years, we don't know. Uh, maybe things will go back to quote unquote normal. Um, but I believe that librarians out of almost everyone are going to be really good at adapting to whatever situation comes up. In fact, I found that uh, even as COVID hit and okay, no one's lo no longer allowed in the building, uh, we were already pretty well prepared libraries um, to serve the people at home. Uh, as long as they had an internet connection, even then, okay, let's install some hotspots. Um, so I, I, I am very positive in the power of librarianship. And I think no matter what happens, the library will be there to support the community members and the community at large. And the library is a neutral space, right? So um, when and if people are allowed in the building, everyone is welcome. And that is extremely important to me. And I think it's a, a, a meeting place. It's a, a place to commune and um, connect with others. And the library will always be that. Thank you. Along those lines, though, that, that is a fascinating question that Jim answered. We're almost out of time here, but uh, uh, that Jim asked, uh, uh, is there anything in the world of libraries right now that is, is sort of speaking to changes that might be on the horizon? Uh, you know, we, when we look at uh, development trends, uh, you know, there's all this talk about people moving out of the cities and so on. Uh, and so communities, municipalities are looking at that and saying, well, you know, maybe the towns of the future are going to look different uh, because, uh, you know, and, and the towns that will, are prospering will be different towns that are, that are out there now. Is there anything that people have spoke about in libraries that looks different, that, that it's saying might be different in the, a post-COVID world? The most different probably is how people um, spend time in the library. So. Right now, people are not even coming in the building for the most part, and they're just picking up their items outside the building. When people are allowed in the building, um, they're not going to be allowed 
right now to sit and read a newspaper uh, or hang out and play with toys in the children's room. And that's jarring for librarians. Um, what does it mean? What will people, where will patrons relationship be with the library if you can't make those connections with the librarians themselves or with um, the services and programs that we offer? Um, but I find it to be overall positive. Like I said, I think we'll adapt no matter what, uh, as we already have. I haven't seen any like huge trends beyond just Zoom programming um, and trying to reach patrons virtually. I actually think curbside is hugely popular and people are gonna want that after COVID and for years to come. Um, I've been using it myself. I go pick up my book. Mm. Okay, great. Other questions? And, um, I Yep. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And so I think um, what I'm hearing for most librarians is that we want we want curbside to stay for a very long time. Okay. Any other questions that people have? Okay. Um, closing comments uh, from you or um, Sandra? Sure. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm grateful. I'm first of all disappointed that we can't meet in person. Obviously, I, I'm much better in person than I am virtually. <laughs> but I, uh, I want to say that I'm grateful for being able to tour your library during COVID. And I think uh, I really see my strengths being um, appropriate. And and I think it's kind of what you guys are looking for. Um, I'm without selling myself too much. I'm feeling really excited about this position, and I hope you are too. Um, so, but either way, good luck in your search, and I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. Great, thank you, Sandra. All right, thank you, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, all right. Does anybody need a break? We're a little bit behind, but like to stand up and just to give full credit it was Katrina that came up with the speaker thing for Jim that wasn't me thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Miss Katrina maybe you should have been host oh no you're good <laughs> thank you <laughs> Katrina you I just wanted to let you guys know that um Jennifer Inglis is in the waiting room so whenever you want to begin again we can just say the word I could use some more water all right. yeah, we just have a minute break here. One minute. One yep. minute. <clears throat> All that rain and something, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I gotta go back. <laughs> All 
All right. You ready? I'm ready. Bring it. Are we ready? Okay. I'm bringing Jennifer Ann. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Good to see you again. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn you quickly over to uh, Michelle to uh, introduce herself and the other members of the committee. You remember that Michelle though from the screening committee. So Michelle, yep. how are you us? Yes, I, and I gave you the tour on Friday. So hi, That's Jennifer. Right. That's right. Thank you. Right. Good to have you here tonight. And uh, I will sort of go, go down the list. Um, I'll turn it over to Mitch. Hi, I'm Mitch Cohen, Vice Chair of the Library Trustees. Very nice to see you again, Jennifer. Yes, you as well. And Jim Hogan. Unplug your headphones, Jim. <laughs> and then unmute. You're still on mute. <laughs> Are you there, Jim? I'm not sure. Oh, yep. There we are. <laughs> you were momentarily. <laughs> I think Jim's telling you, Jim, we're having trouble. There you go. You're off mute now. You can say it again. Okay. Nope. Headphones have, you, headphones have to be I think he's double. Are you good there, Jim? Nope. Nope. All right. We'll come. No, we'll come back to you, Jim. We'll come back. We're going to move on to Nita. Hi, Jennifer. This is Nita. Hi, Nita. And then Jocelyn. Hi, Jennifer. Jocelyn McKelleny. Nice to meet you. Hi, you as well. Thank you. Charles. Hello, this is Charles Reckia. Nice to meet you, Jennifer. Hi, you as well. Thanks. And Joan. Hi, Jennifer. I'm Joan Scott. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Thank you. Richard. Hi, Jennifer. I'm Richard Tucker. Nice to meet you. Thanks. All right. And um, again, you know me, Michelle Wehill, and you know Bernie Lynch, who is um, facilitating these interviews for us. Sure. Thanks. Um, all right. We have one more trustee who could not be here tonight. So I just wanted to let you know. Okay. All right. So, Jennifer, let's. Uh... You've, you've met us all now. Uh, yes. Tell us briefly. Uh, oh, there's Jim says hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> the um, see, Jim's very creative. So, yes. um, let's uh, tell us about your briefly. We have about an hour okay. uh, for this, and we have about seven or eight uh, topics that we want to get through. So, sure. if you could just give us an overview of your career, why you got into library. The world of libraries would be an interesting start. And then your career, and then why Northboro? Okay. Um, I think uh, when I was a kid, I'm kind of like my daughter is now, where she's so into school. And um, when I was in second grade, I decided I was going to be a teacher. And that's all I did, and that's all I wanted to be. And I became a teacher. And during the summers, I worked at the local public library and uh, realized that that was a way better fit for me. Um, I was always the teacher telling people to look things up, <laughs> that it was, you, did, you know, memorizing facts wasn't as important as knowing where to find them, those kinds of things. I had my, my shelf in my ca classroom cataloged and um, I decided to shift into libraries about 20 years ago. And um, my cousin's wife was a librarian and when I met her, it just like everything clicked. And since then I've been um, in libraries working my way up. Um, 
I <laughs> honestly went into management so that I could pay my student loans. Um, but I do really love it. I love dealing with the finances. I like being in charge. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty good uh, meeting runner. Um, I like to support staff doing really good um, work. Uh, but I, I also am definitely an administrator. Um, I love um, public libraries specifically because of the opportunity that they provide for people. So for some people, um, it is, you know, a busy working professional's audiobook that they can listen to on their long drive. For other people, it is very much a lifeline to applying for jobs or um, medical insurance or anything like that. And we can provide access to resources that people don't necessarily have at home or choose not to, to have at home. Um, we also, you know, I love reading and, you know, it's not kind of the cool thing to say, but books are my jam. And, uh, you know, I'm a, definitely a people person, but I do believe in the, the literacy piece of libraries and having libraries be part of an educated society. Um, you know, over the last six months of COVID, uh, just, you know, I have aging in-laws and I have a daughter who is fully remote and, uh, we made the really tough decision to relocate and we are moving south of the city, um, which is, you know, <laughs> a long drive. And uh, we are actually going to be living with my in-laws uh, probably in a month. Our house sold today. Oh, so when we just, <laughs> yeah, it was few, uh, when we decided to make the move, unfortunately, that meant that I needed to find another job. And um, I love Linfield. I love the town. I love my staff. It's, you know, it's really hard to think about leaving, especially in the middle of this pandemic. But when I saw that Northborough was open and, um, you know, I used to work with Bonnie and I talked with her a little bit about it. And I feel like the size of the community is similar. It's, you know, a, 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 a professional working community and, you know, it's about the similar size and, um, I'm, I'm excited to be able to do the same kind of work I'm able to do in a community of a similar size. Um, it feels like things are, um, I don't know, when Michelle gave me the tour the other day, I just felt like I sort of just fit right in and I could see working with people. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to find another opportunity now. I was a little worried that I might have to leave my job and, and not um, not find work right away. Um, and you know, the timing is perfect. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad this opportunity was here and I'm, I'm glad you all have been so welcoming. Great. Um, so you, you were in Whitman, uh, and then, um, you went to Nahant and there seems to be mm -hmm. this somewhere between 2010 and 2012, uh, this, a gap there. Yep. Um, so. Yeah, so I changed jobs a couple of times because um, my husband went to the UK for um, his MBA. Yep. And when he came back, it was the middle of the, um, the, the economic recession that we all <laughs> thought was the worst thing that was going to happen um, in our <laughs> lifetimes and our libraries and figuring out how to redo that. And I took a job um, that paid a lot more money. Um, and then we were supposed to move to the UK um, and I ended up leaving one job and we were supposed to go to London and then the government in London changed hands and his visa didn't go through and we had rehomed our cats and gotten rid of our cars and we're living in my in-laws house. We always seem to end up there. Um, and we ended up moving to Vermont for a couple of years and I couldn't find a job in Vermont. So, um, I applied for 126 jobs <laughs> and I worked part-time in retail and loved it because I, I, I'm that kind of person. And, um, you know, then I just really missed being in libraries. And so, uh, the Nahant opportunity came up and we decided that, you know, coming back made more sense than staying in Vermont and, and struggling to, to make ends meet. So I came back without my husband and then he came back a year later um, and then we went, I was in the hunt for um, several years and I loved that. Um, it's a very small town, but it's not at all sort of 
small town vibe. It's a, a very cool place, a uh, very cool building. Um, I, I loved it, but my dream job opened in, in Boston and that was what I sort of imagined myself. I wanted to be Amy Ryan. I wanted to be the president of the Boston Public Library. And I took that job, I got it. Nobody was more surprised than me. Um, and I quickly realized that it was, you know, eight or nine hours of meetings every day, very little interaction with the public. Um, and I was working there during the great uh, missing art situation and Amy Ryan ended up leaving and it was a really chaotic time. And um, we, it, there's a residency requirement in Boston and um, we were trying to buy a house <laughs> and, or, an apart, or a condo. And uh, it was, you know, three quarters of a million dollars for a two bedroom with no parking. And it just didn't seem right. And uh, my daughter, we were thinking about her for school. And so we just decided that you know, all of the perks of the position and, and um, or all of the downfalls of having to live there and not doing library work, um, we decided that I would stay home with my daughter for a year and, um, and then start working again. And that's what I did. And we moved back to Salem and, um, and then I took this job in Linfield. And now once again, we have a, a crisis <laughs> and we have sworn that we will never move again. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving into my husband's childhood home. So I said, if we're moving again, it's to buy a vacation home somewhere when I retire. Uh, can't do it anymore. <laughs> All right. So you, you'd be looking at Northboro then as uh, a, a step to an, or what exactly does Northboro represent to you in terms of? I am so tired, honestly, to be frank with you yeah. that, you know, like I didn't think I'd be looking for a job again for a while. You yeah. know, like I can't promise that I will retire from Northboro. I still have 20 years in the system, mm -hmm. but I also have a lot of other things in my life that I want to focus on, you know, and being the president of the BPL is not one of them anymore. You know, I'm, I'm really happy working with an excellent team, trying to find really um, interesting ways to provide services. Um, it's really important to me that I fit in somewhere and I felt really nice. I was so glad that I had the opportunity to go to the library the other day because it just made me, it was a little awkward to think about going somewhere where I hadn't actually met anybody in person yet, you know? Um, and honestly, I just, <laughs> I wanna I want to lead a good team. I wanna be in the field and, you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna write my murder mystery novel and have my daughter have a really great life. Um, you know, so my priorities I think have shifted from 10 years ago, so. Great. Well, let's talk about your uh, your vision of a, of a library. You, you become, you know, uh, we have a sense of, you know, why you got into library science, library information science, and uh, public libraries in particular. Uh, in your mind, what's the vision? What's your vision of a successful library in 2020? Or if you'd like, 2021? Yeah. Um... So I am really hopeful that we can find a way that libraries are still vital and recognized. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a little worried that the longer this pandemic goes on and the longer it takes us to be able to resume some normalcy, that people are going to start getting used to not having us around. Um, and I think it's going to be a big focus of the next year or two to make sure that our normal patron base is engaged um, and that we work really hard to try and find ways to stay engaged with folks who aren't using Facebook and um, Instagram or, you know, whatever social media things we do that are so popular and so useful. Um, but we have people who don't use those things. And um, in Linfield, I was just in an interesting thing where it was one in 10 households don't have a computer at home. And that's not something you would really think of in an affluent community. Um, but, you know, uh, many seniors don't have computers at home. And that doesn't mean that they don't want to be engaged. It's just their choice. You know, and so we're currently working on a, a product project to circulate um laptops and stuff to send home with hotspots so that people can access the internet at home 
Um, I was just reading about something today about it, this one library sent postcards home to every, every household to let them know of what was going on. And I just thought that was kind of a brilliant way of connecting because I think we're gonna need to spend the next year, year and a half, keeping those connections because we're very good at connecting with, with people. Um, there are always areas we could do better, um, but it's gonna be especially important in the next year or two. Okay, so um, leaving aside the, and, and I sort of led us down that path with, with, uh, with COVID, yeah. but I mean, what is the, what is the, what do you see as the purpose of a library in a town? In a, in a municipality? Yeah. You know, I think, I think there are a lot of people where some other things aren't necessarily that third place. You know, that's a common sort of um, conception of libraries that might be a third space or your favorite restaurant is a third space or, you know, if you're a sports kid, it, that's a, the safe, uh, your third space. Um, if you're a parent, the after school program is a, safe, is a third space. And a library can be a third space, but it's also a safe space for people. And I think that the need for a place where people can come and do their business and not have to pay for it, um, that is such a key part of public library services is that you're, you know, anybody can come in and use your stuff. That's part of the collective experience of libraries. Um, and if we're doing our job right, everybody should feel like they sort of own a piece of it. Um, and, you know, if it's just to look up a dryer model from Consumer Reports, or if it's to, you know, to fill out that, those tax forms, or if it's to do the early literacy thing, I, I just, there's nothing quite like the library. And um, I'm noticing a, a struggle with that now, trying to explain how we're different from things like grocery stores um, and how we're different from, um, you know, like the school, for example, is um, on the emergency management team in um, Linfield, but neither me nor the head of the senior center are part of the emergency management team. And I think both of, I ha both of us have a lot to offer in that conversation and also in the the breadth of our services that we provide, you know, we truly serve from birth to death. And there isn't really any other thing in a community that does that. Um, so I think that's, that's the key thing, the, the message around that. Now there are lots of things to think of in terms of, you know, technology and, um, you know, automation and robots and VR and all that kind of stuff. And I think there's definitely a place for that uh, kind of exciting, fun thing for people to play with um, and bring home with them and stuff. But um, libraries really are about that space, um, whether or not it's inside the walls or if we go out to a community and do, you know, the story time like um, Katrina did this weekend, or, you know, if somebody goes to the senior center and does something or a rotary luncheon, you know, there are so many ways to make those connections in the community. Okay. The, um, talk to us about some, in, 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 when, Give us examples as we go through these, but what type of programming have you introduced in your uh, library? What do you see as the uh, type of programming that uh, you might be interested in bringing forward in Northboro? Yeah, sure. So that actually, that was one of the questions I was gonna ask is the director in, in charge of programming for in Northboro or is that you know in concert with other staff or? Um, Michelle, do you wanna? Uh, yes, um, the director, in the past has done some programming, but uh, the, the, the professional staff each has a piece of that and yeah. they contribute certain things. Yeah. So um, I have a lot of examples actually of um, programming. I think in Whitman, one of the things that we did that was really um, great was we launched programming around job resources. And um, we noticed that People, our resume books were going out. And this is, again, was uh, in 2008, 2009. And um, we started doing programs or we did a week of programs. You know, I did mock interviews with patrons. My head of reference did uh, cover letter writing. I roped my husband into helping people write their resumes. We got really good feedback and a lot of traction with these programs. Um, and the MBLC actually, um, 
took notice of what we were doing and their libraries for job seekers grant was uh, sort of a, a, they took our idea and expanded it. And so that was really awesome to see that. And that was totally in response to what we were noticing. Um, and not even me, that was my staff noticing and making a comment about it. Um, also in Whitman, we did the first community reads for the community. Um, and we did the book, uh, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Um, I don't know if any of you have read that, but it's lovely. Um, and I actually went to Guernsey because I was inspired by that book. Um, and so that was a fun month long celebration. Um, in um, Whitman, I also wrote several grants um, for um, creating a health reference center and for creating an, um, some programming for teens because we didn't have any at that time. Um, in Nahant, I, um, Nahant didn't really do any programming for adults. Um, and so we, we built that up um, and we also developed a teen program there, got the first tag going. Um, we, uh, history is a really big deal in Nahant. So we did a lot of programming bringing in um, local authors um, and um, like reenactors, historical reenactor people. people. Um, in Linfield, we do a lot with books. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we sort of the book groups on different topics. We have a, um, a cooking club, although uh, not a cooking club, a, a cuisine club. Uh, that, that was prior to my term, but I would definitely want to borrow that because that's what we do well. Um, I have several ideas for things that I would like to do. One, I think a library is a great place to start a podcast. Um, and there are several around. And I think that would be a really interesting way to connect with people through the rest of the pandemic and even further highlighting local businesses, highlighting town employees, stuff the library is doing. Um, I have this, <laughs> you know, I mentioned before that I want to write a, a novel and um, I really think we could do more with writing groups. Um, and there's this really cool podcast I listen to and it's like a 10 episode arc and each at the end of each episode, there's an assignment. So for it's for podcasters, but it can also be translated for artists and writers. And I have this idea of doing a series around that and then we each participate in that kind of thing. So I think like I have ideas just because that's what I do. Um, but I also think it's important to respond to what the community needs. So, you know, there are a lot of the LSTA grants and I saw that you all have one for the, um, the conversation circles, you know, that kind of thing is really important. So even though I might want a writing group to keep me focused, um, if nobody else in the community is interested in a writing group, I think it's really important to tap into that energy. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think strategic planning is important because that's one of the opportunities you get to engage with people and ask them the questions you want answers to. Um, we did that in the hunt. And um, one of the things I found was that when I asked people what they wanted from their library, people didn't really have um, anything more than what we were already doing. Um, and unless they had gone somewhere else, you know, at the time, Nahant was not automated. It was a card catalog based library in, in you know, 2012. And so now they're automated. So that's great. Um, but when I asked people what their hobbies were and what they did in their spare time, we got a lot of really great ideas for programming. So gardening, being outside, sailing, all of these things. So that information, when you say, what do you want from your library? You know, so nobody's going to say, oh, I want books about sailing, you know, but they might attend a program with the director of a sailing program, um, you know, and, 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 and make that connection that way. So I'd want to tap into what the community is interested in and then build the programming around that. Okay, great. Uh, getting more, getting more into the sort of the, um, nuts and bolts maybe, or sure. not the program isn't, but sort of the traditional sense of, you know, libraries are a place where we hold materials yes. uh, for people. What, um, do you have a philosophy with regards to the management of the collection? Philosophy? Um, not. Uh, or pro philosophy? Or pro <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think uh, I am a practical person when it comes to things like this. I think Physical materials need to be in good shape. They need to be current. Um, they need to, you know, be things that people want. Um, I am a firm believer that weeding has to happen. Um, 
And I can give examples. When I took over in the hunt, the last weeding took place in 1992. And so we had books about cancer and books about AIDS for kids from 1992, wiring books for your house from 1992. Those are extreme examples, but they're, they're examples of what can happen if you don't, if you don't maintain that collection. Um, I think it's really important that, um, you know, the books are in good repair. Uh, so paying attention to that. I think digital is super important and that's going to be a way that we need to increase, um, especially if people are hesitant to come into a covered space for a while. Um, yeah, current materials, finding out what people want, um, you know, sort of practical. Uh, let's talk about, um, this is a managerial position. Uh, you know, you're going to have staff. Um, how do you, uh, what's your management style? Uh, and how do you motivate staff? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think my management style, I think is to trust that people will do their job. And if they don't, then you have to address that kind of thing. Um, and unfortunately that's the reality sometimes that you have to deal with negative, negative situations. Um, I think that when you have an opportunity to hire, you hire really good people and let them do their jobs. Uh, I try really hard not to be a micromanager. Um, there are certain things that I have very strong feelings about. Uh, one of them is that we should never call uh, a book for a child who's learning how to read an easy reader. I think that's um, entirely the wrong language to use with kids and parents who, who might be struggling with reading that first book. Um, but beyond that, <laughs> as long as things are, you know, done well, done on time, um, you know, that kind of thing is fine. Um, I like to trust that my department heads are running their departments well. Um, I try to, um, you know, I meet with my department heads now regularly and I, I want to know if there are problems. Um, and um, I don't know, I think it's, you know, when you work with a bunch of people 40 hours a week, you spend more time with them than you do everybody else in your life. So it's really important to try and figure out um, how people tick and how, you know, this, this is kind of just uh, people who run circulation departments have a certain personality that might be different from um, the children's librarian or the young adult librarian, you know, and they both have really important skill sets, but they may not exactly jive. And so I sort of feel like that's my job to create a team of people who are working towards the end goal. Um, I kind of think... Yeah, I mean, I assume that people, you know, in libraries, that people are mission aligned in some way. And, and that may not always be the case, because sometimes just having a municipal job is great. And people want that. Um, and that's okay. But they also need to understand that it's bigger than just a paycheck for, you know, for the directors and for, you know, other people like this is libraries have a very special, are very special space. Okay, great. The, um, in terms of the um, uh, hiring, you mentioned that you like you want to hire the best people. Yeah. How do you de how do you describe the best when you're hiring someone? Yeah. What's the what are the factors that you weigh in hiring those people? So, I think for me, I've learned the hard way a couple of times that um, hiring someone because you need someone and you're in a rush isn't always the best way to go. Like you, you need to find a, a person who's going to do the job, do it well, fit in. Um, I, I have a bit of a, of an instinct, I think, um, for seeing people on paper and seeing things that they, um, something that they might have that doesn't come across. So for example, right now in Linfield, we had a position, we had 70 people apply. And I would say 70 out of 70 were people we could have talked to. And obviously we couldn't do that. And so we had, you know, went through those applications and um, 
I insisted that we interviewed two people that nobody else wanted to interview because they didn't have any library experience. And I said, we can teach library experience. We can't teach customer service or, or you can do that as well, but like this mm -hmm. attitude of serving the public. And um, we ended up hiring one of the people that nobody else would have interviewed um, because I saw from her resume that she's got, uh, you know, that sort of customer service perspective that we really wanted in this position. Um, one interesting thing is we're currently going through um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training at work um, and in Linfield. And our last meeting, we talked about this idea of fit. And um, one of the things that's really important in Linfield, and I've had to fill five, five positions, three were empty when I started. And, um, you know, the team in Linfield is very close knit. They get along really well. And so having the right person in there is, is kind of more important than their qualifications. But in this diversity training, we were talking about uh, this idea of fit and making sure that fit isn't code for some sort of internal bias. And I thought that that was really interesting. And it made me stop and think about that in, in terms of what we were looking for and what I would be looking for in another position and making sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, I think, you know, sometimes you don't get to hire people and you have to work with the team that you have already. Um, and that's where I think it's, you know, really important that the director talks to people, goes, visits the departments, um, you know, checks out book at, books at circulation. And I am kind of a goofy person and I like to joke around a lot and, um, I, I, I don't want to be an intimidating person to people. Sometimes the director position, people automatically, you know, put that in a weird spot that I just don't want to be. Um, so I think, you know, I work really hard to, 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 to build relationships with the people around me. Okay, good. Um, let's keep on going with relationships. Sure. We're going to talk about relationships with the community. How do you, uh, what has been your experience in uh, outreach and engaging with the community at large uh, and with other departments? And you actually mentioned that something about that a little bit, but let's just focus on how do you get out and uh, get people to understand the library and the significant role that it can play? Yeah, I think, um... It involves a lot of putting your neck out there. <laughs> uh, it, it can be intimidating to try and break in um, to different groups and you might hear things, you know, like when I started in Linfield, I was told that the senior center director doesn't like the library and to not even bother with the senior center. And I'm like, well, that doesn't, you know, we seem like we could be a perfect ally, but having that piece of information, um, so I was able to connect with the, the director of the senior center through a colleague that I uh, work with on Rotary and he worked with her and I was like, you know, I heard this thing, what do you think? And he's like, no, she's great. I don't know what they're talking about, you know? And now she and I have had an opportunity through COVID, you know, now that we're meeting over Zoom all the time, you know, it's a, it's a little easier, honestly, than trying to coordinate an appointment to meet in each other's office when we can be like, can we talk for 15 minutes, you know, or grab each other at the end of another meeting or something. And we're, we're building some good relationships. Um, I think, you know, I know about myself in Whitman that reaching out to community groups was hard for me. Um, I sort of expected that people would contact me and say, hey, you run the library. Can we do this cool thing here? Um, and that doesn't, doesn't automatically happen. Those are relationships that you have to build. And so I would go, um, well, can't do a lot in person right now, but you know, when you have the chance, I like to go out to eat. I like to, you know, I'd introduce myself to people. I'd find the businesses that are around um, the library, you know, and go do that, say hello, leave my business card. Um, I think, you know, I'd want to, uh, you know, the first interview I know the town administrator was on um, and, you know, be talking with them, um, trying to get involved in department head meetings at the town level if they are. Um, you know, sometimes there are some natural partnerships. Like I think with the senior center, there's some natural partnerships. And then there are others, you know, like I know rec department sometimes 
is, it's not Parks and Rec, I swear, uh, but you know, like the Rec's department, a lot of times they charge admission prices for their events and libraries don't. And so there, there can be a tension there. Um, I don't think that tension has to be there. Um, and so we just have to figure out ways of saying like, you're doing this paid event, maybe we could have a table and it's an added benefit for the people there. I think, um, you know, the find out what the local organizations are in town that, you know, it could just be they want to put a flyer up, but they might want some meeting space. Um, you know, if there's a topic of concern in the community, you know, finding out what that is and finding out how the library can help in Linfield, it's, you know, um, opiate uh, addiction had, took a huge toll in the in the community several years ago. And so now there's a big push for recovery resources and a nurse reached out to our head of reference. And then we, you know, we pulled together this resource um, and they're now becoming sort of a, um, a connection in the community for that. And people say, oh yeah, the library has these things. And we have some that you can just take home. You don't need to check out so that people can just go. We have a private space for that. Um, you know, so it's just, it's a lot of, shoe, what is that shoe leather? Is that the, the yeah. phrase that, you know, um, it, it's a lot of work, but it's, it can be really fun and very rewarding when you can make those connections. Okay, great. Uh, I do have an example, the, uh, well, I guess maybe you did already talk about this a little bit with your, uh, with the senior center, but uh, examples of working with other departments, um, Yep. So um, particularly in Linfield, um, we've done a lot of work with, um, or we've tried, <laughs> we do work with the um, Recycling Committee and Tree Commission, um, organizations that are always looking for ways to, or departments that are looking for ways to get their information out to a different audience. We are working is uh, part of a substance abuse um, organization run through the school. Um, it's called a healthy Linfield in Linfield. I'm not sure if Northboro mm. has a similar one. Um, you know, so I'm on the board of that. Um, and, you know, we meet monthly and it's a, that's a terrific, I mean, it's a sad opportunity, but it's a terrific opportunity to meet people, you know, the heads of the local hospital and the um, recovery center and select board members um, and, um, you know, school board members, you know, so all of these different people are in the room, the local clergy, they're all in the room at the same time. And we're all talking, you know, so today, for example, I have my meeting this morning, and um, we are currently in the middle of a community read um, around a kid's book called Guts. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Um, it's a graphic novel for middle grades. And it's about a girl with anxiety and she, her stomach hurts, and she doesn't know why her stomach hurts. And so we chose this book um, as sort of a back to school, here are things you can do. We chose a kid's picture book called The Worry Book. Um, and so we're, we're having a, you know, events and programs around that. We've done some pickup crafts. And so I was just telling the folks in this meeting this morning about this effort. And so Rotary was there talking about what they're doing. And I was, you know, one of the select board members was there and the wife of a, another select board person is there the, you know, several people from the school committee. So we're all doing our own thing to help with this issue. Um, but it's a very community based um, mm -hmm. uh, um, effort. Right, okay. Initiative. How about, how about uh, working with other uh, area libraries? Do you, is there much in terms of you, are you active in partnering with other libraries in the region? And oh, yeah. in either the hot Whitman or Linfield. Yeah. Um, I, I am not somebody who can come up with ideas on my own. I need to borrow them from other people and we are librarians and that's what we do. <laughs> so um, yes. So I've always been an active member of um, the Massachusetts library association. Uh, professional development is really important to me. It's important to me for my staff as well to have opportunities to meet with people um, you can learn so much just by, you know, visiting another library and going and see how, how things are, are happening there. Um, just in June, I started an organization, not an organization, but a weekly meeting with directors across the state, including some who are um, adjacent to uh, Northboro. Um, 
and we meet weekly and we talk about how we're all dealing with reopening plans for, for COVID-19. Um, and so that's been a really great opportunity. And there are a lot of people from Western Mass in there um, and, um, but, you know, cross network because, you know, we have our our networks. So, you know, I'm in Noble now and I used to be on the executive board of um, OCLN when I was in Whitman. And you can get kind of very close into those those groups, but I think it's really nice to be statewide. And I really like the, the larger organizations too. I think it's good. I also think that um, we should be looking at other organizations that aren't necessarily libraries as well for opportunities to partner. So like museums, for example, or um, banks even, you know, there's a lot of, I think I told that story about how I met my husband through the bank sponsoring my summer reading program, but you know, like different organizations have ways to make connections as well. Okay, good. Uh, any questions any member has at this point? Go ahead, Mitch. Um, you talk a little bit, you already spoke a little bit about community. I'm, I'm particularly interested in any experience fundraising through the community. Mm -hmm. So whether that be um, trying to get a sponsor for an event or fundraising to uh, have more money for, for increasing the materials budget or for uh, to, to increase the endowment fund. Yep, yep. Um, so, you know, I've done some, you know, I work, I work with friends pretty much every group, every library has a friends group of various um, strengths, I think. Um, in Boston, I worked with the Boston Public Library Foundation pretty closely with the reopening of the Central Library. Um, you know, we did some pretty big ticket items there. We had a gala, we raised money for, um, you know, the children's room primarily was the focus for me there. And it's quite extraordinary. If you haven't had a chance to see it, you should go. Um, I still don't understand how they got the glass to work when you go inside. It's this just a bunch of noise. And then the second you leave the room, you can't hear it. It's amazing. Um, in Nahant, um, I worked with somebody who uh, was a, a member of an organization who um, there was someone on the island who had a lot of money and she wanted to give it somewhere and uh, she wasn't impressed with the library thus far. And this woman had talked with me about something else and she asked me to come up with a plan for a two million dollar gift. Um, and so, yeah, so um, the, the, the plan was for a small program that if successful could lead to something else. And so <laughs> you bet I dropped everything and worked on that. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but, um, you know, it was nice to be able to think in that sort of broader sense. Um, this isn't direct work with it, but I did just take a class through um, the University of Michigan, I think, has a lot of really good online professional development. And I took one on fundraising and particularly in um, in sort of that foundation based um, uh, finding people who might want to leave um, estate money, that kind of thing. So I have some techniques there. Um, and then in terms of asking local businesses, a lot of that is, you know, again, that going knocking on the door, so to speak. There's a lot of money in, in corporations for their, you know, in their marketing departments and their corporate giving. So there's places there. Well, that, raises, that raises the whole issue of uh, your financial management uh, yeah. overall. Can yeah. you uh, talk to us about uh, how you go about uh, preparing the budget? How do you, what's your priority as you develop the budget um, in, in the process that you use? Sure. Um, you know, I, I do think that the library should be part of, a, 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 is a team player in the town. Um, so I think working with the finance committee and, you know, the town administrator or, or whomever is drafting sort of the budget plan for the year, you know, and so if uh, you might get a warning that we're going to have to level fund everybody this year, or you need to do a 10% cut, or you need to do 1% increase after salary increases or, you know, get the lay of the land for that um, and then do the budget, um, you know, with the trustees as well about, you know, keeping those uh, parameters in mind. Um, so I think it's important to follow those kind of guidelines. I do, however, think it's really important to be honest about what the actual needs of the library are that may not jive with what the town wants. 
Um, you know, and so, you know, I will ask for another position, even though I know it's not going to happen this year. Maybe if I keep asking, I'll get it, um, you know, and, and I can be persistent like that. Um, and it's happened twice that I've been able to do it. So um, I think, um, you know, it's really going to be an interesting budget year this year, figuring out what to do, because nobody knows what's going to happen next. And so having um, the opportunity, you know, kind of a fluidity and knowing that you might have one set of documents due. Um, and then when, when the revenues come in in the spring, we might have to have to refigure that. Um, I presented in front of the finance committees in various towns. Um, I've, you know, worked directly with, you know, trustees developing the budget. My experience has been very much that I do the budget and present it to trustees and, and get feedback that way. I don't know if that's how that works here, but um, I do really like doing that money side of things or, or accounting side of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to be precise in that. Um, so. Okay. All right. Um, anything that you've done in your, in the development of the budgets or your management of the finances, <clears throat> you know, Mitch's question about fundraising, we could, I guess one, uh, another thing we could talk about, but is grants. Uh, yeah. What's your experience with grants? And then I, I'm interested in anything that we'll call entrepreneurial. Yep. That is sort of a little outside the box to bring additional revenue in or um, new services into the library. But let's start with grants. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I have quite a bit of experience with um, LSTA grants. So those are the grants that are issued through MBLC. Um, mm -hmm. I actually worked with one of the um, departments um, back when I was in Whitman and I was a grant reader for them. So I kind of have a perspective on how they, how they look to read the grants. Um, I have written uh, Community Preservation Act grants. Um, I have written Cultural Council grants. Um, I took a class a million years ago on the foundation directory and that kind of thing. So I'm pretty familiar with grants and following deadlines, making sure you, you, you do the things. I think a challenge with grants is finding the grant that you want. Um, and not just being, you know, boxed into what, you know, the 10 choices from LSTA are. Um, in terms of entrepreneurial, you know, you, you asked me that last time and I was, I was kind of befuddled and I didn't really spend a lot of time coming up with another answer because I, <laughs> I didn't know I have a good one. Um, I think the, the best way to sort of be entrepreneurial is to talk with people who are entrepreneurial um, and, and make them see that, you know, the library can be a partner. Um, Michelle was, when she was giving me a tour, she was showing me the room where, um, you know, that the library had hoped to have people coming in and, and drinking their coffee and doing work. And, you know, it didn't quite mm -hmm. pan, pan out like that. And how um, Northboro is going to look towards creating a, a, a walkable downtown. And I was like, that would be a really great way to connect with the local business owner um, and, you know, coming up with ways that, you know, the library can partner with people in an interesting way, like, you know, uh, maybe working together with, um, say, you know, the children's department could do a program session while the parents are working with bankers to do you know, uh, estate planning or, um, you know, wills and um, guardianship kind of stuff, you know. So, and then you make those connections to, to, to for potential asks for, for money. Um, you know, Rotary in Linfield, we raise money to give money away, <laughs> which I think should be our tagline. Um, you know, so finding the organizations whose missions it is to do that. Um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, those are our businesses um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people who are working really hard on side gigs um, and side hustles and, and finding out a way to get the library. I don't know if it would be a money making kind of thing, but at least it would be tapping into that energy and um, right. maybe letting those people do some, some, some hustling for you to find some funds. Okay, good. Um, one of the um, aspects of the position too, and I'm sure you've, um, I know that you run across this before and other your other communities, but facility um, management <laughs> maintenance. Yeah. Uh, you've seen the Northboro Library now. Yeah. Uh, we're you know curious as to your thoughts uh, about the library, uh, yeah. and then your experience with uh, managing the facility. Uh, yeah. Ultimately, the town hopes to have a facility manager, but 
uh, right now, you know, you have to be the one that had to deal with uh, the issues that might come up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've had to shovel walks. I've had to, I fixed a toilet once. That was an exciting moment in my career. Um, there's a big joke in library director land about the things they don't teach you in library school and building maintenance is a big part of it. Um, I, Nahant and, um, and Linfield are historic buildings. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Uh, we had a Palladian window, which is one of those giant, beautiful windows. Um, but it was many, many, many years old. And it was <laughs> anytime there was wind, the, the window would shake. Um, and so, you know, I basically spent my first year pushing to get this fixed. Um, and unfortunately, at, at town meeting when it was approved to get fixed, they estimated $10,000 and it was closer to 100,000 by the time it got done um, because of all of the various things, taking a window out, it turns out is a very expensive proposition, you know? So just making sure um, I did work with DPW, obviously I didn't go there and take the window out myself, um, you know, but, but making, finding out who the right person to talk to is about that. Um, you know, since the um, Northboro has both the historic building and the newer build, I feel like I've had that because Whitman was a new build building. I think it was um, maybe only 10 or 15 years old when I was there. So, you know, and even with a building like that, like we had the, the, the air conditioning would break on the, the hottest days and we had, you know, HVAC issues, it feels like all the time happening. And so you just have to figure out who to call and be on top of that and escalate things if it's, you know, is it something that can wait until tomorrow or next week or does it need to be done today? Um, committee questions that we haven't hit that I've missed here. Anything? Um, did we really get into the uh, sort of the team building management style? Oh, right. Yeah. Sort of thing. Sure. Motivation. Nope. Yeah. I totally forgot to answer that. Um, so I think, um, I think being transparent with people is, is a way to, to motivate. Um, I think, you know, in, in Whitman with the economy tanking and uh, the library was constantly on the, the cutting block uh, for, uh, for funding. Um, you know, I, I didn't try to hide the fact that we really needed to keep our eye on the ball for people, um, you know, and I, I tried to be honest about whether or not there were impending, you know, cuts that could impact staffing, because that's really, I think, what people worry about. Um, but that can be a tough sort of morale thing. And so I think it's really important to be, you know, honest with everyone about how you're feeling, um, you know, with COVID. So here's a you know, we got sent home and to three o'clock in the afternoon, we were saying one thing, seven o'clock in the evening, we were saying another 10 o'clock Friday morning, we were done. And we, you know, so we had like this kind of moment of like, am I, what, what's going on here? You know? And, and for me, I was like, I don't know what to do. And I didn't want to bother people. You know, I figured we were all freaked out. And then after a couple of weeks, you know, I met with my department heads weekly because that's what we do, but I didn't want to bother the part-time staff. And then somebody, you know, kind of tugged on my sleeve a little bit and was like, you know, can we have a staff meeting with everybody? And, you know, we had this great thing. And then we started meeting weekly because they wanted to be bothered. You know, they wanted to be included, even though, you know, they weren't doing as much of the day-to-day -day running of the library. And these are mostly the circulation folks who didn't have a lot of physical work to do um, from home. And as we were building our reopening plan, um, we, I, you know, at one meeting, I was like, you know, just really honest about my feelings and my anxiety about this and wanting to do it right and wanting to make sure that, you know, everybody on staff is safe. Um, so I had, I created a, a Google drive for the entire staff. Um, up until that point, it was just limited to department heads and, you know, various subgroups or whatever. And then um, I started a document where I wanted um, everyone to send their direct supervisor, their concerns about reopening. And I didn't care how teeny they were. I didn't, you know, I didn't care. I wanted it, all of them. And so, you know, everybody put together what their concerns were and we consolidated them. And it was 16 pages long, this document. 
And during uh, the next meeting, we went through and we went by it through it line by line. And one of the lines in there was, you know, like, I'm really scared, <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, you know what I am too. And this is something that I'm struggling with as well. And, you know, I realized that uh, this is a, an extreme example of what it means to be an, uh, an employer, but you know, I love public libraries and I love the work that we do. And I'm inspired every day by my colleagues. But at the end of the day, I really feel like my first priority is to be a good employer. And that means to make sure that I'm following the laws, <laughs> that people get their breaks, they get their benefits, they have the opportunity to use their EAP, um, that um, you know, that my door is open for conversations. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not perfect at it for sure. You know, I've had way more conversations with my full-time staff than I have with my part-time staff. I'm actually have had more contact with my part-time staff over zoom than I did the entire year before that. Um, and I sort of regret that. And I think about how I would do that differently, um, and how I can communicate better with people. And I think, in terms of motivating, I think communication is a huge part of that. Um, you know, like I love bringing food in, you know, but that's chocolate, that's my jam, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, but I think having a good workplace where people feel respected um, and have opportunities to grow uh, is, is, is kind of the biggest motivating thing that we can do. And that's something I'm really trying to, to work on. Okay. Thanks. Um... Other questions that people might have. About out of time. Uh, oh, could I add one thing to that? Sure. Um, <laughs> so one thing I think is really important is, uh, and it's, it's something that has driven me crazy when I've been an employee of someone, is I don't ever take credit for someone else's work. And, and that seems like a small thing, but you know, if, if somebody's doing something, they're gonna get the credit for it. And you know, if somebody wants to thank the library and thank me for our hard efforts, the first thing I'm gonna say is the team did a great job. And I think that's, that's kinda, you know, I feel very strongly about that. Okay, thanks. Uh, any closing comments you'd like to make, Jen? Um, no, I mean, I'm really excited about this opportunity. And I know, you know, that you might look at my two and a half years here and two and a half there as, as a problem. And I know that that's a risk, but I am, you know, I'm committed and I love my work and I, I <laughs> just kind of, kind of done moving up the ladder. And I just want to be at a place where I can do really good things for a long period of time and build that team. Um, and I really feel like North Row would be a good fit for me. And I hope that you um, see that in me as well. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, I know that the staff in North Borough has been without a director during a lot of this and, and um, you know, this, the assistant director has stepped up to help. But even if I'm not hired, I'm happy to offer my experience having been open for several months to whomever is hired to help because it's really stressful. Um, and if they are not you know, haven't had to do it yet. There is so much that we can learn from each other and the things that have happened. So I just want to make that offer and, and, and thank you for your, your opportunity, this opportunity and your time and all that. That's great. Thank you. And, uh, uh, we, I think we uh, very much enjoyed uh, having the conversation tonight and learning more about you and your thoughts about, uh, libraries and uh, in particular the, uh, in your experiences and what you could bring to the North for a library. That's yeah. been very helpful. So. Great. Right. Well, Great thanks, day. everybody. Good luck. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Jen. All right. Bye, Jen. Okay. All right, Deborah. Uh, uh, Michelle, do you want to um, jump right in? Do people want another minute? People probably could use a minute. I think we'll take one minute. One minute. Michelle, Jen is ready. So whenever your minute is done, just give me the cue, okay? Hey, Deborah, is that done via a waiting room, like a Zoom waiting room? Is that how that's done? Yes, it is, Chuck. 
So um, that's how I can just see her in the waiting room and when okay. Michelle gives the word, we'll let her in. Okay. Is everybody back? Nita, are you there? Yep. Just wanted to double check. All right. I think we're all back. So we are ready for Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer's coming in now. Thank you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Jen. You have to unmute. <laughs> it, be, it won't be. A, it won't be a very interesting interview if we, we can't hear you. So. <laughs> Right. a lot of guessing. <laughs> uh, I will, uh, it's good to see you again, Jen, and I'm going to turn you over to Michelle and she'll uh, walk you through the introductions and then we'll get started. Michelle. Thanks. Hi, Jen. Good to see you again. I um, just want to welcome you and say I'm going to have the, this is the full board of, oh, no. This is the board of trustees minus one. So one person was called into a work meeting, so couldn't be with us. So I will just go down the list and have people introduce themselves to you and say hello. All right, so I'll start with Mitch. Hi, Mitch Cohen, uh, Vice Chair of the Library Trustees. Good to see you again, Jim. All right, Jim Hogan, let's see if you can do it. <laughs> Unmute. We're having an, a mute problem. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh. Oh. Unmute, one more time. It's a single no, click. Just, just one click. There you go. Poor Jim. He's been having a, a problem today. Jim is the secretary of the of the board. <laughs> All right. And um, Nita. Hi, Jen. This is Nita. And Jocelyn. Hi, Jen. Jocelyn McKelleny. Nice to meet you. Charles. Hello, Jen. I'm Charles Reckia, board member. Nice to meet you. Joan. Hi, Jen. Joan Scott. Uh, nice to meet you. Welcome. Richard. 
Hi, Jen. Um, I'm Richard Tucker. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Hi. Uh, and, all right. All right. We ready to get started? All right. We, uh, we have about an hour and uh, we have about seven or eight uh, topics that we want to talk about. Um, and um, let's start with, uh, you know, you explaining to us uh, a little bit about your career, how you got into uh, the world of uh, public libraries. Uh, it's always interesting to start and then tell us about, you know, what you've done. And then, you know, we really want to focus in on why Northboro. Sure. Um, so it's really nice to meet everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I've been, I, I sort of always knew that I was going to be a librarian. Um, I would say from about high school or early college. Um, sort of went to grad school, not really certain if I was gonna do public libraries or academic, um, but I was able to get a job in a public library while I was working towards my MLS um, down in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is a really big city of a quarter million people or so. Um, fell in love with it, honestly. Fell in love with working with the public. So sort of made my decision based on working full-time in a public library. Um, I worked down there for about eight years. Um, loved every second of it, but you know, I was born and raised in Connecticut and I, after about eight years, I decided it was time to move back north. So I took the job at the Boylston Library as their director, where I've been for about nine years. Um, and again, love it. Uh, huge change from the Fayetteville system. I went from a huge urban city setting to a town of 4,000. <laughs> um, but the people, you know, people are people everywhere. Um, so it was, it's still a rewarding experience, even though it's a bit smaller. Um, recently, I got involved with the New England Library Association. So I started off as their VP slash conference chair, um, mostly due to my interest in mentoring and um, conference planning, which came from a side gig as a wedding planner, um, which I'll tell you about some other time. <laughs> um, definitely an interesting um, experience with stressed out people. Um, so they asked me to be their conference planner for the year. And uh, that was last year. Fortunately, uh, a little bit easier than the conference planner's job this year, since, you know, the pandemic kind of threw everything sideways. Um, so I've been their president for this year that lasts about another month. And then I'll be their past president, which has slightly different, um, less extensive job duties. So it's been really interesting to kind of get out of my little bubble of Boylston, um, kind of see how librarians through different states uh, do things and what our similarities and differences are. Um, yeah, so then with Northboro, you know, we're, we're next door in Boylston. So I've always sort of known about the programs that you're doing. Um, we shared a couple employees through the years. Um, so I was always sort of on my radar as a place that seemed really progressive. Um, I really liked what the library was doing. Uh, so when I saw the position come open, I started kind of looking through your long range plan and, you know, trolling through the website. Um, one of the things that really interested me about Northboro was that you had put out uh, a diversity and equity statement uh, a couple of months ago. And um, you have a confidentiality policy that talks about uh, how you will protect your patrons and how they use the library and their data, which as a privacy advocate, I'm always kind of encouraging people to think about how libraries can protect their patrons. So that was really um, kind of an interesting thing that intrigued me about you. So that was why I decided to apply. I would like to, move into a bigger setting. Um, I was looking for a place with more diversity, um, with some more opportunity to take some of the ideas that I have and put them into practice. So here I am. Great. All right, well, tell us about your ideas. Which ones? <laughs> well, our, uh, next, our next topic is sort of library mission. So what are your ideas and you know, that you want to put into practice about what makes a library? One of the things that had been kind of on my radar before 
before the pandemic and before 2020, but really is driven home by everything that has happened this year. Uh, for me is that the library should be a place situated in the community where we're sort of at the forefront of diversity, of serving that community, of really understanding that community. I don't know if there are too many other organizations in any given town that are better situated, have a full understanding of what their community is and what they need. Um, so I really want to lead a library that has a strong connection to their community, understands who they are, is committed to serving everybody in an equal way. Um, sort of this year, libraries have been kind of figuring out what our systemic issues are within the profession. So I would like to be part of those conversations, um, try to figure out how to diversify the profession and also how we might be missing opportunities to serve our patrons and how we can do better. Okay, can you give some, some examples of what, uh, what you've done in Boylston that might reflect some of these ideas? Sure, um, the first thing that we really did was we took a good hard look at the policies that we had. Um, what are we charging fees for? How is that affecting our patrons? Um, what kind of programs are we bringing in? What does our collection look like? We really, um, <laughs> we really had a moment when we looked at our fiction collection um, in terms of the types of authors, the types of genres, the topics that we were covering. And we realized that we had a real hard boiled mystery problem. <laughs> um, way too many of our books were written by white female authors a lot of them were a certain type of mystery. Um, our collection development was not balanced whatsoever. So that was really one of the things that we had to uh, work on a plan to solve um, and work on diversifying the types of authors, the types of books. Um, you know, we were really, really heavy on the James Patterson and a little light on some of the first, first books from authors. So we've been working over the last couple of years to diversify all of our collections and to build a good core current and popular collection that really honestly reflects um, the growing and diversifying community that we have. Um, we got rid of overdue fines. We stopped charging for faxes. We were charging, I think it was $5 for the first page and then $3 for every page after that. And we found out the people that need the fax machine, really that's a significant sum of money. Uh, so that was one thing that we did away with. Um, we stopped charging for a replacement library card, um, other things like that. So we really, I mean, we overhauled our policies from front to back and really took a good hard look at everything. And I think that was um, really the basis for what we have done to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. so. What about in terms of programming? What, you, the, uh, what types of programming do you think, uh, or have you put in place, or uh, do you advocate for, for in a public library? So when I first started in Boylston, we were doing one story time a week and one craft a month for school-aged children, and we had a book club. That was it. <laughs> um, so now we had, well, Pre-COVID, we had a program almost every day. Um, when every month we sort of, we do our publicity for our programs a couple months ahead. So when we are finished with a slate of programs for the month, we look to make sure, you know, do we have something for different age groups? Do we have something for different interests? Um, you know, we're not always just doing crafts. Now we're doing Fortnite for kids or, a secret pizza party or something like that. Um, we're doing more business programs, um, more career development, things like that. Those have been really popular. Um, we're doing yoga and stress relaxation uh, techniques right now, which has been really popular. We started doing those weekly um, because they've been so popular. Um, when we sort of take a broad annual look at our programming slate. What we're trying to do is just make sure that everything is thoughtful and deliberate 
and not just sort of thrown in. So for example, um, our children's librarian had decided she wanted to do a diversity story time. So she was looking for a very specific person. Um, in this particular case, it was a drag queen. Uh, there, were, there are no drag queens that we know of that operate out of Boylston. So she was looking further and further away, it wasn't really a community-based thing and it was out of the blue. So I said, let's take a step back and we'll look at our children's programming as a whole. You know, it's not so much having one person come in and read a story as it is making sure that all of your story times, so right now we have four a week, um, are all of our story times incorporating diversity all the time instead of just doing one story time where it's here, this is our diversity story time for the month. Um, so we started incorporating um, different books, different guest speakers. So now we, uh, well, pre-COVID, we had about one a month um, and it was not specific. We're gonna go look and try to find this person that meets a certain quota, but it's, you know, are we making sure that our speakers reflect the diversity in our community? Okay. The, um, so how do you define, you know, you, you probably answered this already in your, in your the, when I asked you about your ideas of a library, for the library, but how do you define the success of a library in a community? I think we know that we are successful when we hear about patrons telling other people in the community how great of a resource the library is. So for example, in Boylston, anytime somebody new moves into town and posts on our, we have a little community Facebook page. Um, I frequently see people say, make sure you stop at the library and get a library card and, you know, go to their programs. This is an awesome way to meet people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one indicator of success. We do look at our numbers as well, our circulation statistics, our visits, our door count, um, hits on our website, things like that as sort of a um, data-driven indicator of success. You know, as long as our stats aren't significantly going down, we can be reasonably certain that what we're doing is successful but really it's those personal stories of people telling, either telling us or telling other people um, what kind of positive experience they've had. Okay, great. Right. Uh, in Boylston, you, uh, and, and I'm taking this right off the, the references that we spoke to, um, describe to us the um, change in the library's image and uh, reputation, um, and, and they they spoke very highly of your of your ability to do that. What? How did you go about doing that? Um, the first year, I really took a good hard look at uh, what was going on, uh, rather than come in with any preconceived ideas. There were some sort of gimmies with the inside setup of the library. It was quite crowded. Uh, it really needed to be weeded and there was a lot of furniture. Um, their circulation desk area, for example, was actually a combination of about eight different desks that were all different materials, all different colors. Um, just visually, it looked very uh, busy. So the first year, I didn't make too many drastic changes. We just sort of went through and we started weeding the collection down. Um, once we were able to weed, we were we found we were able to get rid of some of the furniture that really didn't match. Um, we got rid of the carpet that had been installed upside down. So instead of keeping the moisture out, it kept it in between the padding and the carpet. So it oh. smelled delightful. <laughs> Um, so my dad and I went in on a weekend and just ripped it out, threw it in a dumpster, um, painted the floor, kind of just put a little work into it. Um, and then we kind of celebrated even like small changes. So like we got rid of the carpet, we took pictures before and after, 
put them on social media, put them on our website. Here, look, we're making changes. Started to build a little bit of momentum to get people to come into the building, which sort of served to highlight how inadequate some of our facilities were. This was before we renovated. So we had very old bathrooms and our children's room looked and smelled like a basement. It was a very small area. So, you know, we figured we'll get more people in and then we'll start to increase our programs. We talked about, you know, these weeding projects that we did, again, pictures before and after. Come and check out our new improved collections. You know, here we're trying these programs, come and see, got people in and started to just kind of build a reputation for being open, being welcoming, being forward thinking, making new changes. Um, and we just kind of kept that going through the years. Even after we renovated, we made sure that we were still offering something exciting and new while still maintaining our really, I have very high standards for customer service. Um, so while maintaining that um, as our kind of base. Okay. The, um, the uh, discussion of customer service seems to speak somewhat to your, your management style in terms of um, expectations of your staff. Well, how would you describe your management style and how do you motivate em em employees and, and hold them accountable? Um, my management style, it sort of changes depending on the person. I found through the years that having one rigid style um, and treating, when you treat everybody exactly the same, you can actually wind up treating people unfairly if that makes sense, everybody has different needs and responds to different things. So I try to adapt my management style based on the person that I'm managing. Some people need a lot of, I don't wanna say handholding, but a lot of guidance, a lot of instruction, a lot of positive feedback. Um, and some people would rather just be given a project and you know, here are the metrics, here's the deadline. Let me know if you have questions off you go, I'm gonna leave you alone to do this. So I've tried to, excuse me, tried to develop an understanding of who the person is mm -hmm. and what they need, um, as opposed to just deciding like, this is me. Um, real me is very, very positive. <laughs> yeah. I like to give compliments. I like to give feedback. Um, through the years, I've come across some people who, don't respond well to constant praise or, or too much praise. So I try to dial it back a little bit for some people. Um, but when it comes to motivating, I'm a very high energy person. Um, I try to listen to everybody's ideas and take their feedback and sort of combine it into something that works for everybody that takes into account, you know, what everybody's concerns are what their fears are, what their excitement is, um, and, and just sort of, you know, put all the pieces together. Uh, I find that the more involved you get your employees, the more motivated they are, the more they take ownership of change and the less you have issues. And when you do have issues, direct communication, here are my expectations, which, you know, should really be clear from the start. But if somebody's not living up to it, then you just kind of go back over it. Um, I coach soccer. So a lot of the methods are kind of the same. I try to coach my employees as opposed to dictate or um, punish. Uh, so usually it's, I try to start with a positive conversation and see what's going on if somebody is not really living up to my expectations, which are usually simple, um, easy to understand. And I state them very clearly from the get-go. So everybody that I interview for jobs really understands this is exactly what I'm looking for. So there's no surprises. Okay. Along those lines, when you're interviewing people for jobs, what do you look for when you're hiring them? What's the, what's the central focus of your decision? Um, it sounds strange, but I really look for people who don't necessarily agree with me. Uh, I don't want an echo chamber. I don't want a team that has um, you know, 10 people that all have the same strength. 
because then we probably all have the same weakness. So I look for people who seem like they are, and it's hard to tell in an interview sometimes, but looking for people who seem like they understand how to advocate for themselves, that they would be comfortable in a team environment where you're able to express your opinion honestly, and that you will respect a difference of opinion as others will respect yours. Um, I also look for people with a strong customer service background over people who may have a strong library background, although mm -hmm. it does help to have um, an interest in libraries and position dependent, you may need to have some, but some of the best employees that I've hired at uh, the library currently work there and it's their first job in libraries, but they had a great customer service uh, outlook, great work ethic, and they're not afraid to ask questions and they're not afraid to disagree with me. Yep. So that's what I look for. Okay. The um, going back to um, sort of still t focusing on relationships, but looking at it from a broader perspective outside of the internal staff, um, what, um, how do you go about, you could, maybe you already. Um, touched upon some of this, but let's elaborate on it uh, in terms of community outreach. How do you uh, build a sense of, you know, if you were to come into Northboro, how would you build a, a relationship with the, the residents and, of, of Northboro uh, and engage uh, the community with the library? Uh, it's a bit of a, um, I come at it from a couple different angles. Um, First is getting to know the staff and your regular patrons who are already in the library. So getting out of your office, uh, getting a feel for the workflow, the daily, um, you know, your regular patrons, uh, what a typical day is like in the library, what your patrons are coming in for. So you take a look at the statistics for the last couple of years, try to identify trends. Um, and you know, attend some programs, try to meet some of the people who attend story time or, well, you know, once we go back to normal, <laughs> um, attending, you know, book club, who, who is a regular at book club um, and getting to know those people first, because those are really your champions. Um, and the other approach that you take is to get out of the library completely. Um, some of the greatest success that we've had is, um, just getting, we have t-shirts that have our logo on the front. They say Boylston Library and then they're like sports shirts. So our last name is on the back. And we just wear the shirt out at community events. So I will go to watch the Tahanto girls soccer team or um, the Pop Warner football, or we'll go to the local theater or Tower Hill or just, you know, whatever community event is happening. If we're out and we're attending it, we're wearing our shirt, we're introducing ourselves. Um, I try to attend, you know, the garden club meetings. Um, I introduce myself anytime there's a new um, town employee. Try to just make sure that my face is out there um, and find people where they are and get to know them. And, you know, if the opportunity presents, then I will talk about the library, which the opportunity always presents itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's really fun to um, just be able to get out and be a part of the community and let people see that you care about them as people, no matter what they're doing. Okay. Uh, do you have some examples of some um, um, collaboration with uh, other town departments that uh, to, you know, um, magnif maximize the impact of the, the library's uh, uh, resources? Sure. Um, the one that comes to mind that we were the most excited about before March um, was we had a partnership with the Council on Aging and the Worcester Art Museum. So we have a trustee who is also a docent at the museum. So he would meet people at the library. We'd have a little snack. Um, he would have like a little 20 minute. It's not really a lecture, but just like, this is what we're gonna look at today. 
um, this is what you're going to see, this is what to look out for. And then the Council on Aging would bring their van with their driver, pick everybody up at the library, bring them over to the museum. We used our museum passes to give everybody a discount. Um, and then he would give a tour of the museum. They, maybe the museum director or an employee would come out and kind of greet everybody and say hello. Um, we did that twice a month for, we had been about six or seven months. Mm. So that was one that was really, that had a wait list because um, there were only so many spots available given the number of passes that we have. Uh, we started having people say, you know, can I still join the tour if I just pay full price and drive myself? So um, that was, we knew it was really successful. Um, we have a partnership with the Garden Club. They have started, well, they were this year, they were going to do some junior gardening uh, programs to teach uh, young kids how to garden, um, specifically vegetables, but also um, plants and just basic identification of different plants and things like that. Um, but they they have been doing programs with us for a long time. The Historical Society usually does a um, collaborative program with us. Um, this year, or well, for the last three years, we've had a program that is joint funded by the school, the historical society, the library, and the Council on Aging. Um, it's usually a holiday themed program. Last year we had a Dickens, um, he dresses up like Dickens and, and did like a dramatic reading. Okay. Um, and that drew quite a crowd that was really fun. Right. What about regional? Uh, anything, relationships with the other libraries in the region? Uh, shared programs or? We have a partnership with um, the Berlin Library for some of our museum passes. And that has been, um, I think over 10 years, mm. um, simply because the smallest package for some of them is, is way too big. Um, I think the Equitarium is one where there's no way we could use all the passes in one year, but you know, divide it in half. Um, we also share book page subscription with them. And in the past, we have done some shared programming where if we can book a program at a couple of different libraries in the same day, the performer will give us a discount because the travel is, is ne negligible. So that has worked out really well. Um, I am part of a little, little group of different directors in the area. Um, we were meeting once a week when we first shut down um, just to kind of stay in touch about online programming and kind of the state of libraries and reopening. I found that to be really helpful, really grounding to see that other towns are kind of in the same situation. Um, and we had been talking about, you know, is there a cost sharing potential for, you know, if we all need web design services or if we want to kind of go in and collaborate on a bigger author especially if it's a virtual event where they're just doing one and we're kind of advertising it to the different towns. So that's something that we kind of have in the works right now. Great. Okay. The, um, do, you, do you use much uh, social media? What, what's the, what platforms do you use to go? You know, how do you communicate with this, the community at large? Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out weekly, which I think is probably the thing that gives us the most direct engagement with our patrons. Um, our Facebook page is still fairly active. We use Instagram. We have a Twitter. <laughs> Twitter doesn't really, it's not very good for directly communicating with patrons, so we don't use it very much. But we do find that sometimes people are looking for the library and they start with Twitter, so we have the account and it does tweet things um, from our Facebook page, but we've kind of stayed away from it because it just wasn't really going anywhere. Um, our Facebook page and the Boylston neighbor Facebook page uh, turn out to be the biggest social media successes that we have. Um, we tried TikTok for a little while and TikTok users really didn't connect with us. Um, and it was taking forever to make 30 second videos. <laughs> so 
So the ones that we did were good, but we couldn't really find a, um, you know, what was in it, what was working for us. So we kind of shied away from that. Was the community newsletter, was the uh, library, uh, weekly newsletter uh, in place when you arrived or? That they were, um, they were doing a monthly or bi-monthly e-newsletter okay. at the time. And it was just basically, you know, here's the information about book club and um, any other programs that we might have coming up and a link to our website. And that was it. So now we do one weekly. There's um, all of our new books, all of our new DVDs, our programs, other information about the library. Um, sometimes we'll promote something that seems to have stagnated. So it's a bit more robust. Um, it's more engaging. It's more colorful. Yeah. Because <laughs> it used to just be black and white text. So now there's a little design element to it. Okay. Um, other questions that people might have right at this point? Mitch? Hi, um, a little bit more on engaging with the community, but to beg for money. Um, when there are programs that uh, might want to fund or um, you know, increase the operating budget to buy more materials, or uh, I don't know if, if the Boston Library has an endowment fund or anything like that, uh, what are your experiences with uh, looking for money locally from the community? I'm great at looking for money locally. <laughs> um, when I first started, we didn't have a programming budget at all, which was part of the reason that we did so few programs. Um, and part of that was we had a very small friends group that did not, they did great, but they were very small. So there was a limited amount of stuff that they could do. Um, so the first thing that we did was bolster their membership. And then we kind of gave them some ideas for fundraising um, so that we could have a bigger programming budget. So now we spend about, let's say five or 6,000 a year on, fun, on programming, um, which includes supplies as well as speakers uh, and food. Um, we do have an endowment. We have a foundation as well as a friends group. Um, they do a lot of the larger fundraising for us. So uh, when we were trying to renovate, they raised about three or four hundred thousand um, dollars in grant and private donations for us. Um, we needed the rest from the town. So it was a really big um, marketing push. And a lot of that was related back to the number of programs that we were doing and drawing people into the building to kind of get that word of mouth. But it, a lot of it comes down to numbers. Um, people really wanted to know that we were being as efficient with our ask as possible, that the numbers made sense for what we were doing. So we had to do a lot of legwork to educate people. Um, to convince them to vote yes for a $3 million project. Um, in terms of every year with the budget, sometimes we need more materials. Um, recently, we've needed to expand our hours because we were so busy that we just, we were having trouble fitting everybody in the building at one time. We were running out of days to do programs. Um, we had more requests for evening hours, uh, weekend hours. Um, so we did a survey, worked it into our long range plan. And then when we went to present it to the town, we gave them all the data that we could find that would be helpful. So the number of visits and how historically that had increased, uh, the number of people that wanted evening and weekend hours, um, the number of circulations, the number of programs, the number of program attendees, um, pictures of our full programs, pictures of people kind of jammed into our tiny parking lot and then parked down the street. <laughs> um, and I think all of that really built a narrative that was an easy sell when we were to ask for, for budget increases. So we've had several through the years um, since I've been here. Uh, the hours, we've had more staff added. Um, our technology budget went way up because um, it was, you know, pretty much non-existent. It was the cable, it was the cable bill. 
was basically the line item. <laughs> so now we have a technology plan and we can replace things before they're completely broken, um, which is great for me because I am also the IT person and it's great not to have to try to fix a computer with an operating system that's about four versions old because I'm not that techno, not that technical. So yeah, it's a lot of um, just consistent messaging, um, a lot of getting your, your friends, your foundation, um, the trustees all on the same page and advocating out in the community and your patrons as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Experience with grant writing? I do. Um, smaller grants, we've gotten um, one or two every year for um, the cultural, from the cultural council, from, uh, we've had Walmart grants, uh, most recently, we had a federal grant for some programming relief. Um, the Fuller Foundation, which is a local foundation, gave us $300,000 for um, our renovation project, which um, I did have a big hand in writing that grant. Um, you know, it was about, they were more interested in the historical workings of the inside of the building. Um, and the preservation of it, as well as making it functional uh, so that, you know, it was a, the library and the patrons are better served. So that was a big one. Okay. What, what is your, uh, you know, uh, so you're responsible for putting the budget together each, each year. And mm -hmm. how do you go about, how do you go about figuring that out? Um, for me, it starts now-ish. Um, while I'm doing our state financial report um, is a good time for me to kind of look back historically on the costs of things and what we're getting for that money. Um, I'm sort of, you know, vaguely aware through, uh, through the months if there's a big need. So when we needed new, like an additional staff member, we knew that. We knew that right away because we couldn't cover all of the hours, nobody was allowed to take vacation because if they did, there wasn't enough people to staff the building. Um, the hours, people would tell us. So some of it was very easy. Um, the rest of it is just, you know, I'm looking at, did my recycling bill go up? Is the internet, um, did the internet bill change? Is it fast enough? Is there anything that we're gonna need to replace? So I take a look at our technology plan. Um, has the cost of something gone up? So our audiobook collection, for example, um, our vendor, the, I'm really not even sure what the reasoning was. I never really got a clear answer, but it went from about, I would say 20 to $40 per audiobook to almost a hundred dollars. So, you know, can I find a vendor that will charge less. And if not, then I might need to make some adjustments to the budget. So I start getting all those numbers together and mm -hmm. I engage the board fairly early so that I can get their feedback. We can take a look at the numbers, um, start having conversations with the town to see what other asks are coming up for the town this year. Um, if there's a lot of things that are really important, then we might, you know, just go for what we really, really need um, and try to keep everything else as level as possible. Sure. The, um, have you, what's, can you give us an example of a, I'm gonna say an entrepreneurial, but a creative idea that you've uh, put in place um, to, to sort of something that's cutting edge and innovative for, for uh, library services in the town of Boylston sure. or in or in your prior position? Sure. Um, the one that comes to mind first is um, in our children's room. We had, we have a space issue. I mean, we're, we're a small library. So any space that we can use that would otherwise be dead space is well served. So we were short on bulletin board space, but we had this big, long skinny dead space above our shelving that was otherwise just going to be blank wall so my board chair and I started brainstorming what can we do with this wall um, we can't really put cork board up there because 
you would have to be able to reach above your head and then back about 14 inches to be able to get to the bulletin board while standing on a chair. So probably not the safest. So we eventually arrived at the idea of a video wall, uh, which is seven screens that are sort of linked together. So we have a Blu-ray player. We have BrightSign software, which is a display software that allows you to um, sort of weave together the different screens. So you can either show one long panoramic image uh, across all seven screens, or you can show, you know, seven different ones. They can be on timers, so they're kind of rotating. Um, we also have the ability to play, you know, you can put a PC um, hook up to there. You can also use, we have iPads in the children's room and you can actually mirror the iPad to one of the screens while still using the other six for something different. Mm -hmm. So the kids can actually, when they're playing the Osmo games or some of the apps that we have on there, um, they can throw it onto the screen and they can kind of all watch and play along. Um, works for small study groups too, instead of hovering over one laptop, now they have a bigger screen that they can use. So it was really multifunctional um, it's really fun. <laughs> we made an I Spy, this giant I Spy game <laughs> that, I mean, we just kept it up and, yeah. and we played it a lot. <laughs> um, it's, I say it's innovative. Um, we ended up on the cover of Computers and Libraries for it. Um, and they asked me to present in Washington, D.C. So I've done a couple talks on it. Um, really caught on. We've had a few requests from other libraries for the um, list of technology that was included so they could do something similar. Um, so it's been really successful. Our customers have loved it. Our biggest fear was that they would hate it because it looks like, um, well, it looks like Vegas when the TVs are off. It looks like there might be some like bedding screens or something like that. Um, but when they're on and they're done correctly, it's bright, it changes the feel of the room, it's something interactive, um, and it's been really successful. Great, thank you. Um, you've, we've spoken about the facility needs and uh, you know, um, your um, experience in managing a facility, um, but you kind of already gave that one away when you talked about ripping up the rug. So uh, apparently you know about managing a facility. Um, what you've had a chance to visit the Northborough Library. What uh, what are your uh, thoughts regarding the, the Northborough facility? Well, I'm really jealous of the big windows. I love those windows <laughs> and all the space you have. <laughs> um, it really seemed like a good. There's a lot of opportunity inside yeah. your building, and I know that um, you're kind of looking at how to temporarily rearrange some of that space so that eventually when you do reopen, um, you're protecting your staff and customers kind of socially distanced and allowing them to use the library in a safe way. Um, and I think we had sort of talked about some of the original intents of the space when you renovated versus kind of what's happening now. You don't really need an internet cafe because the building has wireless. So how do you repurpose some of that space? So you know, of course, my brain just starts going with ideas and like, oh, what can you do with the space? And where can you move your Mayan temples so that they're temporarily not taking up all that space in front of your desk? But if you can still put them back if you want to. Um, I think the with Northborough, the big thing would be obviously um, getting the collection weeded so that you have more space to kind of play with the collections and move them around. Um, but Overall, it's a beautiful space and there's a lot of potential there. Um, board questions, comments? Anyone? Okay. Anything, some sort of closing thoughts, Jen, on what you, uh, you know, why you're excited, so excited about North Pro and how you could, what you think you would do if you came? Oh boy. Um, the first thing that I would 
really want to do obviously is is provide a vision and some practical applications for getting the library reopen at a point when it's safe to do so for the staff as well as the patrons. Um, so developing a plan for patron re-entry into the building, um, of course, dependent upon what the, the numbers in Massachusetts continue to do. Um, hopefully they don't go up too much more. <laughs> um, and then long-term, it does look like um, your strategic plan is up for renewal. I think um, you had mentioned that the staff is kind of working on some basic ideas for that. So kind of getting that going um, so that it's ready for submission when it's due next year uh, and getting to know the staff in the, in the community. What do you think the live, what do you think uh, the impact of COVID will be upon library services? Um, we. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're with uh, the New England Library Association that you people must have talked about this, uh, of what, uh, what could libraries be in the future uh, as a result of the COVID uh, situation? I think the main thing that we have learned this year, um, first, I think everybody's probably pretty much okay financially through this fiscal year, but next fiscal year, I think there's gonna be a need for some strong advocacy at the local and state and federal levels. Um, I think libraries and towns in general are just gonna need um, some financial assistance. Um, the forecast looks a little bit, I don't wanna say scary because that sounds too doom and gloom, but uncertain. Um, so definitely libraries are going to need some strong advocates to make sure that their budgets stay uh, level or if there are cuts across the board that they're not disproportionately cut um, as I've seen in, in some places already. Um, the other thing that we've kind of come across um, through the New England Library Association is the need for staff advocacy. Um, as soon as the pandemic happened, it became glaringly obvious that non-union positions um, need somebody to help give them answers. You know, what's safe, what's not safe. Um, unfortunately, not all managers across the United States are doing the safest things for their employees. Um, they may have different priorities. So just giving somebody an ear, um, giving them information about their rights um, has become uh, something that I've <laughs> gotten a crash course in. Um, it definitely wasn't the New England Library Association's focus uh, when I became the president, but you know, we roll with it and we just change and adapt. And, and again, you know, our members are our customers. So if they have needs, then we're gonna try and find ways to fill them and give those answers out. Um, but I think, keeping people in the profession as well as continuing to draw people in to library schools and to convince people not to exit the profession um, simply because they perceive a public building to be unsafe, I think is gonna be really important. Um, and I don't have all the answers for that yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> Great. All right, well, that, uh, I think that wraps it us up. If there's no, nothing else. And the board will be giving this some consideration. And uh, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you for uh, coming in tonight or being here tonight virtually. Well, however, I don't even know what you say anymore about that. Uh, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you very much. And uh, I'll be in touch as, as we move forward. All thank right. you very much. It was great talking to all of you. Have a great night. Thanks, Jen. Thanks again. Good night. Thank you so much. Okay. Still now, in the meeting, right? We're still in the meeting, yes. All right, then I won't be too dramatic. All right. Um, I think the, if, if I may, the committee, uh, the board has uh, um, a choice. Obviously, we have multiple choices here. <laughs> One choice is uh, the first choice is, do you, are you, do you feel ready to make a decision tonight? Uh, have a discussion to make a decision? 
or would you prefer to come back for another meeting? <sighs> what does the board say? I've, I've learned what I want to learn and I personally, I'm ready, but I've also had the advantage of having a second interview with all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I sort of, I feel the same way, Mitch. I feel like, okay, I, I think I can do this. I think I'm ready. Um, but again, we've had the advantage and I've had the additional advantage of being the one who did the tour with everyone. Um, when they came to see the library. So I, like I said, again, had time to walk with them, observe them, listen to them, see how they interacted with some of the staff members. So um, if other people feel that they need a little bit more time, I think I'd be okay with that. Um, and I think Mitch, I, you, saw, you sort of said the same thing. Um, so for those of you who have spoken to these people for the first time tonight, do you feel that you need a little bit more time to think this over or do you want to move forward and make a decision tonight? Nita? Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of ready if, um, and not ready as well. Um, meanwhile, I did my kind of back and forth, but I still need maybe a couple of days to go back and see exactly what our library needs and what the, uh, you know, the three different people, three different approaches we need to get in through this, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different uh, view to each and every thing we ask, so... Mm -hmm. I'll need some time to think about it. I know my answer, but I still need to give everybody a fair chance, you know? Okay. Well, Richard? Um, if we're, if we're going to take some more time, you know, maybe it would be helpful to those who, who have only seen these um, applicants once to hear a little bit about what you and Mitch learned during your first interview, whether if there's anything different that you learned then that we should know about. Because really you and Michelle, or Mitch and Michelle, have a little different information than we have. So I think maybe if you could share any things that stick out in your mind, that might be helpful. True. Um, and Jim, I think, you're on mute. You have to press your mute. I'm doing it in it. Got yeah. it. Nope. And just click jump. it once. Click once. There you go. You're good. Nope. Oh, don't touch anything. <laughs> Hang on. Are you doing it? You can it? also hold down your space bar while you're talking, and that'll keep you. Oh, it says I'm. Okay. Oh. Can One syllable at a time. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. It keeps going uh, all by itself. It keeps <laughs> going back to mute. It's um, It's got a, um, I don't want to give it a, say it has a mind because I know it doesn't, um, but it has a, um, it's ornery. Anyway, I would like to, um, review my notes and compare them to the documentation that we had and just try and think back to what I was hearing tonight from the candidates. Um, so I would like to go another couple of days um, and then get together and perhaps have a, a conversation among us, not a long one, but Mm -hmm. a conversation among us, exchange some um, comments that each of us might have. And I would like to hear, um, I think that's always valuable. I'd like to hear what each of you think about uh, the candidates and particularly Mitch and Michelle, as Richard said, as you, you've seen them um, uh, more, than, more than the rest of us had. 
So I, I would like another couple of days. Um, I'm sort of leaning in a direction. I think I know where I'm going, but I really would like to be very comfortable and, and careful with my final decision. Okay. Yes, Joe. No. <laughs> I agree that I'd like a little bit more time. Um, I agree with what Nita said that everybody has a very different approach and it seems like different strengths and different we and weaknesses. And um, again, like to have a little time to review my notes and have some time to, to discuss with um, everybody else, yep. you know, opinions and impressions. Yep. Okay. If I may, I think that that is the best choice. And I think Jim's description of the, uh, the process is, is the right one to think about it, review your notes. <clears throat> I'm sure this is available on uh, your uh, YouTube channel. YouTube. You can go back. You, you went through it once. You can always, you can go back and go through it again. Fast forward through sections if you'd like. Uh, and, um, and then get back together and have the discussion of uh, what you, what I recommend is always really uh, focus on the, the strengths that each one of the candidates will bring to the task uh, and, uh, and then just determine from that which, one, which strengths are the ones that you need the most and you want the most and uh, make your decision. Okay, Joan? I do have one question. I think it was uh, the first, it was the first candidate, um, Sandra, who was, she was the one from Lemonster. Mm -hmm. okay. She made a comment that um, the people on the interview committee knew why she left Lemonster, but that wasn't apparent to the rest of us. So I wondered if you'd be able to share that. Uh, I, I guess the best way to put it is that um, um, the there was a mutual decision by both uh, by everyone that uh, uh, the, there was some new trustees that wanted to head in a different direction than uh, the trustees that had initially hired her. And uh, she felt that it was their, uh, you know, their right certainly to move in that direction. And uh, she was, certainly wasn't going to stand in the way of that. So just okay. decided on both sides to do something differently. Um, and I'd be happy to elaborate upon that with uh, uh, offline. No, that's fine. It's just something that she brought up in it, and uh, yep, we didn't have that background. So thank yep. you. All right. Um, then I, I will ask uh, a, uh, a sort of a process question. If we get together, um, it will be a public meeting, so we have to post it. We need to post the agenda 48 hours ahead of time, right. which, which either means that we meet on Friday night um, or we're looking at next week, um, yep. the week of the 19th. Big, I think probably the big issue you have is your Zoom right. platform has limited because of the way that you use the, the Zoom account. Right, yeah, so at the town level, they only have just so many slots for us to be able to have meetings. Um, Their the, the slots might be, and I, I'll just throw this idea out, their slots might be uh, greater if uh, you were able to do this um, at an either an earlier time, I would think, or an after, like an afternoon, or I don't, I don't know. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the just the town website calendar. Okay. Um, you know, mon Mondays and Tuesdays are heavy. There's only one meeting, right? That's scheduled, posted at this point for Monday night, which is the board of selectmen meeting at seven. Um, Tuesday there's a planning board meeting at six. 
Sometimes there are other things that they know have come up that have been scheduled within the Zoom world for which Andy hasn't received the agenda, so it's not posted there yet. Um, I, I've run into that. Yeah. Uh, but there's nothing on the boards for Friday, and you know, usually there aren't many meetings on Fridays. Right. So you could, you could, if you could do it on Friday, or it sounds like maybe if you could do it, and again, I'm not sure of people's schedules, um, Monday at five to be done by the selectmen's meeting at seven. That would work for me. Does that work for uh, those of you who are still employed? <laughs> Instead of being not quite, but almost retired. I can do Monday at five. I can, do. I can do that. Yeah, that right. works for me as well. Works for you. All right, so if I put in a request and um, we'll ask Deborah to put in a request for a meeting for the trustees for Monday, the Zoom request. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. And I will submit an agenda. I will do that and send that off to the town clerk's office for Monday, October 19th at five o'clock. Locked my work calendar so no one can keep me past five. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, um, okay, so if that is our decision, we'll give you the weekend to think about the rest of the week, the weekend to think about this, we'll get together on Monday. Um, the, the Zoom authorities willing We'll get together Monday at five o'clock, October 19th. Um, if there is a problem with that, um, for whatever reason, I will get back to you as soon as possible to let you know. And unless anybody, does anybody have any other questions or comments that they would like to make at this time? I will, I will jump in and make one more comment. Mm -hmm. if I may. Uh, same offer that I made uh, last week when we met. Um, now that you've gone through the interviews, you have the, their resumes, you have their um, cover letters, you have their reference comments uh, that we included. If anyone has questions about circumstances of these uh, individuals, uh, reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk you through it. All right, I'm missing one piece of, uh, here it is. All right, so yeah, we all did get that from, I had sent that to you from Bernie. It has, it has his comments about the references. Um, I don't remember if I sent it out. I know Joan asked a question. She had emailed me to ask, what was it we had specifically said that we were looking for? So I don't know that I shared with the full board. Um, Bernie, you, the, you, um, the profile? You did the profile that we used as, as the ad. Yep. If I did not share that with the full board, I will send that out to all of you as well. Um, is there anything else that you think you need from us? All right, if you don't, um, if nobody has any other questions, I would be willing to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there anyone who would like to? I'll make that motion. Why, thank you, Mitch. Second. And you second that, Richard? Thank you. All right. So I have to do a roll call vote. So, Mitch Cohen. Mitch Cohen, aye. Jim Hogan. Was that an aye? Thank you. Hamilton's is not here. Need a garage car. Yes, I. Jocelyn McKelleny. Jocelyn McKelleny, I. Great job with my name tonight, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I've been practicing. <laughs> Charles Reckia. Uh, Charles Reckia, I. Okay. Joan Scott. Joan Scott, I. Richard Tucker. Richard Tucker, I. And Michelle Rehill also says I. The motion carries.